Adam Mickiewicz by Encyclopedia Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. Adam Mickiewicz, 1798-1852. Polish poet, was born in 1798 near Novogrudek, in the present Russian government of Minsk, where his father, who belonged to the Shlachta, or lesser nobility, had a small property. The poet was educated at the University of Vilna, but, becoming involved in some political troubles there, he was forced to terminate his studies abruptly and was ordered to live for a time in Russia. He had already published two small volumes of miscellaneous poetry at Vilna, which had been favorably received by the Slavonic public, and on his arrival at St. Petersburg, he found himself admitted to the leading literary circles, where he was a great favorite, both from his agreeable manners and his extraordinary talent of improvisation. In 1825 he visited the Crimea, which inspired a collection of sonnets, in which we may admire both the elegance of the rhythm and the rich oriental coloring. The most beautiful are The Storm, Bakchiserai, and Grave of the Countess Potocka. In 1828 appeared his Conrad Wallenrod, a narrative poem describing the battles of knights of the Teutonic Order with the heathen Lithuanians. Here, under a thin veil, Mickiewicz represented the sanguinary passages of arms and burning hatred which had characterized the long feuds of the Russians and Poles. The objects of the poem, although evident to many, escaped the Russian censors, and it was suffered to appear, although the very motto taken from Machiavelli was significant. Dovete adunque sapere come sono due generazioni da combattere, bisogna essere volpe e leone. This is a striking poem and contains two beautiful lyrics. After a five years exile in Russia, the poet obtained leave to travel. He had secretly made up his mind never to return to that country or Poland, so long as it remained under the government of the Muscovites. Wending his way to Weimar, he either made the acquaintance of Goethe, who received him cordially, and, pursuing his journey through Germany, he entered Italy by the Splugen, visited Milan, Venice, and Florence, and finally took up his abode at Rome. There he wrote the third part of his poem Giade, the subject of which is the religious commemoration of their ancestors practiced among Slavonic nations, and Pantadeusz, his longest poem, by many considered his masterpiece. A graphic picture is drawn of Lithuania on the eve of Napoleon's expedition to Russia in 1812. In this village idol, as Bruckner calls it, Mickiewicz gives us a picture of the homes of the Polish magnates, with their somewhat boisterous but very genuine hospitality. We see them before us, just as the knell of their nationalism, as Bruckner says, seemed to be sounding, and therefore there is something melancholy and dirge-like in the poem, in spite of the pretty love story which forms the main incident. Mickiewicz turned to Lithuania with the loving eyes of an exile, and gives us some of the most delightful descriptions of Lithuanian skies and Lithuanian forests. He describes the weird sounds to be heard in the primeval woods in the country where the trees were sacred. The cloud pictures are equally striking. There is nothing finer in Shelley or Wordsworth. In 1832 Mickiewicz left Rome for Paris, where his life was for some time spent in poverty and unhappiness. He had married a Polish lady, Celina Szymanowska, who became insane. In 1840, he was appointed to the newly founded Chair of Slavonic Languages and Literature in the Collège de France, a post which he was especially qualified to fill, as he was now the chief representative of Slavonic literature, Pushkin having died in 1837. He was, however, only destined to hold it for a little more than three years, his last lecture having been given on the 28th of May, 1844. His mind had become more and more disordered under the influence of religious mysticism. He had fallen under the influence of a strange fanatic named Toviansky. His lectures became a medley of religion and politics, and thus brought him under the censure of the government. A selection of them has been published in four volumes. They contain some sound criticism, but the philological part is very defective, for Mickiewicz was no scholar, and he is obviously only well acquainted with two of the literatures, that is, Polish and Russian, the latter only till the year 1830. 
A very sad picture of his declining days is given in the memoirs of Herzen. At a comparatively early period, the unfortunate poet exhibited all the signs of premature old age. Poverty, despair, and domestic affliction had wrought their work upon him. In 1847 he founded a French newspaper, La Tribune des Peuples, but it only existed a year. The restoration of the French Empire seemed to kindle his hopes afresh. His last composition is said to have been a Latin ode in honor of Napoleon III. On the outbreak of the Crimean War, he was sent to Constantinople to assist in raising a regiment of Poles to take service against the Russians. He died suddenly there in 1855, and his body was removed to France and buried at Montmorency. In 1900, his remains were disinterred and buried in the Cathedral of Krakow, the Santa Croce of Poland, where rest, beside many of the kings, the greatest of her worthies. Mickiewicz is held to have been the greatest Slavonic poet, with the exception of Pushkin. Unfortunately, in other parts of Europe, he is but little known. He writes in a very difficult language, and one which it is not the fashion to learn. There were both pathos and irony in the expression used by a Polish lady to a foreigner, Nous avons notre Mickiewicz à nous. He is one of the best products of the so-called Romantic school. The Poles had long groaned under the yoke of the classicists, and the country was full of legends and picturesque stories which only awaited the coming poet to put them into shape. Hence the great popularity among his countrymen of his ballads, each of them being connected with some national tradition. Besides Konrad Wallenrod and Pantadeusz, attention may be called to the poem Grażyna, which describes the adventures of a Lithuanian chieftainess against the Teutonic Knights. It is said by Ostrovsky to have inspired the brave Emilia Plater, who was the heroine of the rebellion of 1830, and after having fought in the ranks of the insurgents, found a grave in the forests of Lithuania. A fine, vigorous oriental piece is Faris. Very good, too, are the odes to youth and to the historian Lelevel. The former did much to stimulate the efforts of the Poles to shake off their Russian conquerors. It is enough to say of Mickiewicz that he has obtained the proud position of the representative poet of his country. Her customs, her superstitions, her history, her struggles are reflected in his works. It is the great voice of Poland appealing to the nations in her agony. End of Adam Mickiewicz by Encyclopedia Britannica The Battle of Stone River by Henry M. Kendall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After the Battle of Perryville, October 8, 1862, a rather leisurely pursuit of Bragg's retreating forces was made on the roads to Cumberland Gap, but no engagement was brought on. It soon appeared that Bragg did not intend to again give battle in Kentucky, but would withdraw into Tennessee and join the force under Breckinridge, which had been left to watch Nashville during the invasion of Kentucky. Buell concluded that Bragg would concentrate his entire force near Nashville, and endeavor to capture that place, and somewhere in its vicinity, fight a decisive battle which would determine the fate of West Tennessee and Kentucky. Buell therefore discontinued his pursuit and turned his forces toward Nashville, placing them mainly at Bowling Green, Glasgow, and other points on the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. A great deal of pressure had been brought to bear upon the administration to make a campaign in East Tennessee, a mountainous region whose people were mostly loyal. General Halleck in Washington planned a campaign in that region and called upon Buell to carry it out. But Buell declined. His reasons were that such a campaign would place him at a long distance from Louisville, his base, dependent upon wagon transportation alone over almost impassable roads, 
in a country devoid of supplies and especially suitable to defensive operations. Again, he would be forced to make great detachments to guard Nashville and his lines of communications, since these would be especially open to the attack of the enemy, who was well known to be superior in cavalry. Buell considered Nashville the vital point of the theater, and was satisfied that it would be the main point of Bragg's attack. He therefore ignored Halleck's elaborate plan and set about repairing the railway to Nashville and moving his troops in that direction. His previous slowness and indecision had brought him greatly into disfavor, and on the 30th of October he was relieved by Major General William S. Rosecrans. The district was called thereafter the Department of the Cumberland, and the army in the field was designated as the 14th Army Corps. Halleck's plans were urged upon Rosecrans, but he was of the same opinion as Buell, and it had by that time become plain that Bragg was doing just what Buell thought he would do. Rosecrans concluded to go on in the same direction as had Buell, and the events showed clearly that Halleck's bureau-made plans, based upon theory alone, and without an intimate knowledge of the real conditions, were the veriest nonsense, and that Buell and Rosecrans were quite right in ignoring them. Rosecrans organized the army into right wing, center, and left wing. The right wing, under McCook, consisted of Johnson's, Davis's, and Sheridan's divisions. Thompson commanded the center, which consisted of five divisions under Russo, Negley, Fry, Mitchell, and Reynolds. The left wing was commanded by Crittenden and comprised Woods, Palmer's, and Van Cleve's divisions. The total available strength of the army formed not more than 60% of its paper strength, owing to absenteeism. Every endeavor was made to remedy this state of affairs, a condition not peculiar to this army alone, but affecting all the armies almost equally, and constituting a serious evil, for the correction of which severe measures were an absolute necessity. The army was very deficient in cavalry, and a large portion of its meager force was very poorly armed. In this condition, the army was at a great disadvantage opposed to Bragg, whose cavalry under Forrest, Morgan, and Wheeler was much greater in numbers and better mounted and equipped. Rosecrans made strenuous efforts to improve the condition of his cavalry and succeeded in increasing it to about 4,000 and in obtaining Stanley to command it. But at its greatest strength, it was less than half the opposing cavalry force. Rosecrans' future base of operations was Nashville but he would be dependent for supplies upon the maintenance of the railroad to Louisville. He hastened to increase the garrison of Nashville, but could not for some time concentrate there, owing to the destruction of a railway tunnel near Mitchellsville, which limited him to wagon transportation over bad roads for 35 miles. The railway was opened November 26th, and the army was then concentrated near Nashville, with the exception of Reynolds' division, and all but one brigade of Fry's, which were assigned the duty of protecting the railway. Before advancing, it was absolutely essential to place in Nashville a large supply of rations, ammunition, etc., sufficient to support the army during the longest probable break in the railway, as a result of the forays of the rebel cavalry. This required an entire month, and the administration was greatly dissatisfied at the long delay. Rosecrans went through an experience very similar to that suffered by Thomas at the same place later in the war. 
but to the threats to relieve him he made the blunt reply that if confidence did not exist he was perfectly ready to turn over the command and abide by the issue halleck then explained that it was not intended to threaten him but that there was great anxiety in washington over the slow course of events in tennessee he explained that this arose from diplomatic reasons it had been greatly desired that a decided advantage be gained over the rebels before the opening of the british parliament otherwise the advocates of intervention in favor of the confederacy would be able to point to the possession of tennessee as a proof that the south was gaining on the north it would seem however that this was only one of the long series of attempts by halleck to run the war from an office in washington a course that never did and never could result in any good rosecrans continued his preparations carefully and bragg concluded that he was going into winter quarters at nashville bragg therefore placed his army in winter quarters at murfreesboro and vicinity and detached his cavalry for operations in west tennessee and against the railway in kentucky this was just what rosecrans wanted he wanted bragg to draw near to nashville so that his own line of communications might be short and a reverse less disastrous rosecrans was also anxious that the rebel cavalry should be distant when he advanced as his army was very deficient in cavalry morgan's cavalry made a raid upon hartsville tennessee and on the 7th of December captured a brigade of infantry placed there by Thomas to guard the crossing of the Cumberland. The capture of this brigade was due to neglect of the simplest precautions. No outposts or sentinels of any kind seemed to have been used, and the rebel cavalry was in line only 400 yards away before it was discovered the infantry turned out in great disorder and was badly managed so that it was forced to surrender no word was sent to a supporting brigade but a few miles away and morgan was allowed to get away without any loss he then started for kentucky and on the twenty seventh of december captured elizabethtown and destroyed a large section of railway he kept on to Muldrow's Hills and destroyed two trestles, each about 500 feet long and 90 feet high. The railway communication was thus effectively broken, and if Rosecrans had remained in Nashville, the condition of his army would have been critical. But having completed his preparations and finding the conditions favorable, owing to the absence of Bragg's cavalry, rosecrans advanced from nashville on the twenty sixth of december mitchell's division was left to garrison nashville so that thomas's command was reduced to negley's and russo's divisions and walker's brigade of fry's mccook's and crittenden's wings were on the pike south and southeast of nashville the main body of bragg's force consisting of polk's corps and part of Breckinridge's division of Hardy's Corps was at Murfreesboro. The remainder of Hardy's Corps was near Eaglesville, about 20 miles west of Murfreesboro. McCowan's division of Hardy's Corps, with a division under Stevenson, formed a separate corps under Kirby Smith at Reddyville, 12 miles east of Murfreesboro rosecrans plan was to advance in three columns refusing his right mccook's corps was to use the nolensville pike thomas the franklin pike and crittenden the main murfreesboro pike mccook was to attack hardy and if the enemy held his ground and was reinforced thomas was to support mccook if however hardy retreated mccook was to detach a division to pursue or observe him 
and move with the remainder of his corps so as to come in on the left rear of the main rebel force. Crittenden was to attack, supported by Thomas, whose force was to be directed against the enemy's left. McCook advanced, and after skirmishing all day, followed by a brisk fight towards evening, took possession of Nolansville and the heights about one and one-half miles in front. Thomas followed on the right, closing Negley's division on Nolansville and leaving Rousseau's division on the right flank. Crittenden advanced to Laverne with heavy skirmishing through a rough country intersected by forests and cedar breaks. On the 27th, McCook advanced on Triune, but his movements were retarded by a dense fog, which made it impossible to tell friend from foe. Stanley, with the greater part of the cavalry, had joined McCook, and in the fog the cavalry was fired upon by the infantry. The march was stopped until the fog lifted, and Triune was therefore not reached until late in the day, although it was only seven miles from Nolansville. Thomas moved eastward to Crittenden's right. Crittenden moved forward slowly, delaying his movements until the action of McCook's corps should determine the real state of affairs. Thomas was now in position to support either McCook or Crittenden, as the case might require. On the 28th, McCook made sure by a strong reconnaissance that Hardy was retreating, and Thomas closed on Crittenden, who remained in position, bringing up his trains and making ready for battle. On the 29th, McCook left one brigade of Johnson's division at Triune to cover the right and rear, and advanced to within about six miles of Murfreesboro. The corps was encamped in line of battle with Sheridan's division on the left, Davis in the center, and Johnson on the right. Negley's division of Thomas's corps advanced in support of Crittenden's corps, the head and flank of which reached a point about two miles from Murfreesboro. Rousseau's division remained at Stewartsboro. It was now plain that the enemy would give battle near Murfreesboro. During the afternoon, a report reached Rosecrans from Palmer that he was in sight of Murfreesboro and the enemy was running. He therefore ordered Crittenden to occupy Murfreesboro with the division. Crittenden sent a brigade across Stones River and surprised a regiment of Breckinridge's division and pushed it back on the main line. It was found that the rebels were occupying a strong position in force, and, it being then dark, the brigade was withdrawn across the river. Fords were prepared by the Pioneer Brigade. Negley's, Palmer's, and Woods's divisions were in line with Van Cleve's division in reserve. On the 30th, Rousseau moved up and took position in reserve in rear of Palmer's right. Negley advanced slightly, as did McCook's corps. The line generally faced east, but part of McCook's right division was retired so that it faced to the south. Rosecrans now decided to give battle on the 31st and made the following plan. McCook was to hold strong ground, refusing his right, and make strong dispositions to resist the attack of the enemy. If, however, the enemy did not attack, McCook was to attack sufficient to hold all the force on his front and prevent the enemy from detaching any troops to the right the real point of attack. Thomas's corps and Palmer's division were to open with skirmishing and engage the enemy's center and left as far as Stone River. Van Cleve's division was to cross the river and advance on Breckenridge, followed by Wood's division, by brigades on its right, 
and carry everything before them into Murfreesboro. In front of Crittenden's Corps across the river was high ground, the occupation of which would enable an enfilade fire to be brought on the remainder of Polk's Corps. Palmer and Thomas were to follow the movement, advancing in its support. After taking Murfreesboro, Crittenden was to move westward and, getting in on the flank and rear of the enemy, drive them off their line of communications. The success of the whole plan, of course, depended upon McCook's being able to hold on without support, and Rosecrans criticized his line, saying it was an error for it to face so much to the east. He thought it should, rather, face to the south, and impressed the fact on McCook that he must be careful and make a strong disposition. McCook was ordered also to build fires to his right, prolonging the general line and simulating the camps of a large force. It was hoped in this way to draw off a large part of the rebel force from the real point of attack. Bragg formed an exactly similar plan of attack. Hardy, with two divisions, was to advance on the left and force back the Union right. Then Polk was to push the center. By a steady wheel to the right, on the right of Polk's Corps as a pivot, the Union force was to be thrown back on Stone River, off its line to Nashville, the objective of his campaign. The plans being identical, a good deal depended on which army began the movement first. Rosecrans' orders were for the attack to begin at 7 o'clock, while Bragg ordered the attack to begin at daylight. Rosecrans' movement began on time, and for a time was going very successfully. But about 6.30 a.m., the enemy in force attacked McCook's right and found that the two brigades were weakly posted without support, the remaining brigade of Johnson's division being nearly a mile and a half to the rear at Johnson's headquarters. The command was not in any way ready for battle. The horses of some of the batteries were being watered at the stream, and the men of one brigade were cooking breakfast. Kirk's brigade, the first attacked, tried to make some resistance and called for help upon Willich's brigade, but Willich was absent at headquarters, and his brigade was without a commander and made no effort to support Kirk. Both brigades were quickly rolled up. Baldwin's brigade, in reserve, was moved up, but was too far distant, and the rout of the other two brigades was complete before assistance could be rendered. The weight of the attack then fell upon Baldwin, whose brigade, with Simonson's 5th Indiana Battery, succeeded in checking the assailants and inflicting heavy loss, but was soon forced to retire to avoid being surrounded. Meanwhile, a severe attack had been made all along McCook's front, and after the rout of Johnson's division, the flank of Davis's division was exposed. The enemy's attack was repulsed, but he soon reformed, brought up his reserves, and renewed the attack. The attack was again repulsed. Davis's division now formed almost a right angle with Sheridan's, and the rebels directed the next attack on the vertex of the angle. Davis's division was driven out of its position, being greatly overlapped, and Sheridan had to withdraw his right, gaining time to do so by charging with Robert's brigade. His new line was at right angles to his first position. Here he held on desperately, trying to reform the broken division to his right. After repulsing several attacks, his ammunition was exhausted and he was forced to fall back, as was also Negley, whose division had been heavily engaged in front and afterward on the right flank. Word had been sent to Rosecrans soon after seven o'clock that McCook's corps was heavily pressed and needed assistance. 
but he did not realize the extent of the disaster, and it was not until informed by a second messenger that the right wing was being driven that he realized the true state of affairs. He found then that he must abandon his plan and take every means to prevent the terrible disaster that seemed imminent. He directed the movement on the left to be suspended, and placed Rousseau's division in the cedar breaks to the right and rear of Sheridan. As soon as it became plain from the great amount of fugitives that McCook's wing was routed, Van Cleve's division was placed on the right of Rousseau's, and a brigade of Wood's division to its right. Negley's and Sheridan's divisions fell back upon this new line. Upon this line, the rebels made four distinct attacks, but were repulsed with very heavy losses. The fighting was almost hand-to-hand, -hand, and the losses on both sides were heavy. That of the regular brigade was especially severe, being 637 out of a total of 1,566. The new line succeeded in holding its ground and driving back the enemy from its front. The left had also had severe fighting, becoming gradually engaged as Bragg's turning movement went on. As the change of front went on, the left became more important until when the final line was formed, close to the Nashville turnpike, the left became the vital point, since a disaster there would have permitted the line to be enfiladed and the stragglers would have carried any resulting disorder along the whole line. During the afternoon, Breckinridge made several heavy assaults on Palmer's division, but was repulsed. Rosecrans succeeded in placing his troops in rather a strong line near the road, and the subsequent assaults of the enemy were repelled. The army slept in the position, spare ammunition was issued, and found to be sufficient for another battle. The left was withdrawn slightly to more advantageous ground, and Rosecrans determined to await the attack of the enemy in his new lines, but if Bragg did not attack, to do so himself. During the morning of the 1st of January, the rebels made repeated attempts to advance on Thomas's front, but were repulsed. During the afternoon, the enemy massed a large number of troops in front of the right, but did not attack. Bragg's object was evidently to feel the Union lines and find out if Rosecrans was retreating. Satisfied that he was not, he felt himself unable to attack in view of the heavy hammering his army had received the day before. Rosecrans passed Van Cleve's division across the stream and occupied some hills which threatened Polk's lines in enfilade. The next day Bragg tried to drive back Van Cleve's division, which was commanded by Colonel Beatty. The movement failed after severe fighting. During the night Bragg massed his force on his former right, and Rosecrans greatly strengthened his left. On the third, Bragg caused a constant picket firing, to be kept up to determine if Rosecrans was still holding on. Finding that such was the case, he concluded, after consultation with his generals, to retreat. He retreated in good order, his cavalry holding Murfreesboro until the 5th. On the 5th, Thomas's entire command, preceded by Stanley's cavalry, marched into Murfreesboro. The object of the campaign had been accomplished. Up to the 31st, everything had gone favorably for the Union Army. The fighting of the morning of the 31st had been all in Bragg's favor and had almost resulted in the total defeat of Rosecrans. But from that time on, everything had again been in Rosecrans' favor. His losses were on the whole greater than those of Bragg, but the latter's retreat gave the victory to Rosecrans. Rosecrans' force on the battlefield was 43,400. His losses were 13,249, 
more than 30%. Bragg's total force on the field was 44,750, and his loss, 12,334, about 28%. Rosecrans lost 28 pieces of artillery and a large portion of his wagon train, but Bragg lost only three pieces of artillery. While the result of the campaign was attained, the army had nevertheless been very severely handled and for a time was on the verge of utter ruin. Rosecrans' plan was not at all carried out. The reason for this was the faulty posting and handling of McCook's wing, and the fact that Bragg started in earlier in the execution of his attack. Rosecrans knew on the night before the battle that McCook's wing was not correctly placed and ordered changes in it. These were not carried out, and Rosecrans made no apparent effort to see that they were. There has been a great deal of controversy about this matter. One of McCook's division commanders, Johnson, stated in his report that McCook told him that his left was opposite the rebel center, and he expected to be attacked in great force the next day. This was, in fact, true, yet McCook certainly did not make such dispositions as to resist any such attack, even for a short time, and was compelled to call for such assistance as to wreck the whole plan of battle. If he had placed his corps in a strong defensive position and entrenched it, he might have resisted for such a length of time that the main attack could make such progress as to compel Bragg to give up his plan and conform to Rosecrans' movements. Just as, in fact, Rosecrans was forced to comply with those of Bragg. The battle is singular in that the opposing plans were identical. It has been called Stones River by the Union forces and Murfreesboro by the Confederates. For the next six months, little was done, the Union army occupying Murfreesboro and the rebel army a position near Tullahoma. Then followed the campaign which terminated in the Battle of Chickamauga. End of the Battle of Stone River by Henry M. Kendall Read by Jeffrey Smith Colonization of Palestine, the Unit System by Boris Katzman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the following is the first of a series of two articles by Boris Katzman, agricultural engineer, who has made a thorough study of the colonization problems in Palestine. His plan for the colonization of Palestine, as outlined in these articles, will be submitted for consideration of the delegates to the Kasbad Congress. The problems facing the Zionist organization with regard to the colonization of Palestine suffered a tremendous change with the achievement of the new political status of Zionism created by the San Remo decision. The methods which were considered proper under the old status must be overhauled and reconsidered. Under the Turkish regime, colonization was of necessity limited to what practically consisted of slow economic infiltration, and plans for colonization answered in scope and conception to this situation. With a new dispensation, such a policy would be entirely out of place. There is only one policy worthy of consideration at a time like this, and that is a policy of mass colonization. But to mass colonization, the methods adopted under the old dispensation would be inapplicable. Not only the old scope, but the old methods must be rejected. The historic opportunity calls for colonization on a scale hitherto unattempted, and the material problems of colonization must be envisaged in a newer, larger spirit. Shortcomings of the old methods 
Hitherto, there has not existed what might be called a national conception of colonization, either from the point of view of the Yishuv or of the diaspora. There was no large and general plan answering in spirit and scope to the double task of creating a Jewish homeland in Palestine and of satisfying the great nationalist impulse of Jewry throughout the world at large. The problem of Palestine was not approached from the point of view of the building up of a Jewish country. There was no study of proportions of the relative needs of a country in the process of creation. There was no inventory of the individuals, trades and professions called for in the progressive growth of a country as a whole. The individual colonizer came to Palestine at hazard, bringing with him his individual plans, capacities and hopes, unrelated to the general situation or to a general plan. He bought land or developed industry at random, and even from his own individual point of view was either ignorant of or indifferent to matters which should have been primarily considered. There was no classification of land with reference to its peculiar agricultural value. There was no study of industry with reference to the relative need of its various branches. No one kept in sight the growth of a issue as such. The only plan, if such it may be called, was for the incidental growth of the Yishuv through the unrelated settlement of many individuals. No study was ever made of the relation of Jewish production to local Jewish consumption. Such a study was, in fact, considered unnecessary, for the basis of nearly all colonization in Palestine was the possibility of export. The first colonies set themselves the two equally tremendous tasks of opening up a new country and of entering with its products world markets for which there was already fierce competition amongst industries firmly established in old countries. And these markets, even when the colonies did succeed in penetrating to them, proved to be unreliable and irregular. As an instance, the wine industry may be taken. The wine industry was for a long time considered the basis of colonization. Obviously, the wine would not be for the consumption of Palestine, but for sale in the world market. Unfortunately, the grapes grown by the pioneers could not be sold to the wine seller above a certain price, for the wine market was already well supplied, and the new wine had to find a place amongst wines already firmly established. The low price paid by the vintners did not suffice to meet the expenses of the vine growers, and the vine industry had to a large extent to be abandoned. To the labor, time and capital thus lost must be added the additional expense of uprooting the vines and recultivating the soil for some fresh product. Within the country itself, the uncertainty of the market produced equally unfortunate results. Artisans of all kinds came to Palestine without knowing whether their particular form of labor was in demand. The result for them, as is well known, was semi-starvation, followed by a retreat from Palestine. There was no market to receive these people, no organized community to absorb them. These evils were inherent in the system of colonization and increased as colonization proceeded, so that an attempt at mass colonization under this system, or rather lack of system, would automatically defeat itself. Since there was no planned relation between production in the issue and consumption by the issue, the arrival of new consumers was not followed by an increase of production to meet their needs. In other words, the arrival of new colonists disturbed the existing equilibrium in the country from the point of view of consumption. Individuals competing in increasing numbers for the purchase of the necessaries of life brought about speculation by the seller and the rise in prices. There has thus been created in Palestine the usual class of speculator in land, foodstuffs, building material, etc., whose victim is naturally the incoming colonizer. As colonization is carried on or becomes more probable, 
prices continue to rise, and a few individual Palestinians are the ones to profit. As one instance, land may be cited. Land, which 20 years ago cost 10 francs per dunam in the colonies, now costs 7 to 8 pounds sterling, and land which cost the same amount outside the colonies costs 3 to 5 pounds sterling. At the present moment, a room in a city in Palestine costs as much as a room in New York. As immigration progresses, prices continue to rise. Far from a basic solution being attempted, the present system encourages the evil. The task of the colonizer becomes increasingly difficult instead of increasingly lighter. Nine-tenths of the colonizers bring as their only capital their two hands and their energy, so that the Jewish people, which through the Zionist organization must find the necessary capital, will find the prospective budget of a colonizer increasing from month to month, the capital which a month ago sufficed to carry a colonizer through his period of unproductiveness, failing the following month to meet his needs. Conditions must be blamed for this, and not the individual. Industry in Palestine was not coordinated with the inside needs of the new colonization. The industrial and agricultural undertaker in Palestine was not prepared either to absorb the incoming worker or to increase his production to meet his needs. New colonizers were an uncertain element, and preparation to receive them would be an unfavorable speculation. Attempts which have been made to prepare for the new colonizer by an extension of industry have proved a failure, as witness the histories of the foundry industry, the brick and tile industry, and others. Only the importer can thrive, for making no permanent investment of capital, he follows closely the tides of consumption and rises and falls with them. The new colonizer, one individual amongst many, comes at first to increase the consumption of the country. He competes with other colonizers for the purchase of food, shelter, clothing and the implements of his industry, purchasing his needs in retail quantities, paying retail prices, and by his presence in Palestine, increases the difficulty of his own task and of the task of his fellow colonizers. These conditions are the natural result of a policy which regarded colonization as the reduplication of an infinite number of retail businesses. The high cost of these individual efforts to the Zionist organization will be seen from the annexed table, which contains the budget presented by the Zionist administration in Palestine to the London Conference in 1920. Thus, colonization sees itself retarded by its own growth. The colonizer himself becomes discouraged, and the Jewish people, faced with an ever-increasing burden, will begin to lose faith in the possibility of transferring a large portion of the Jewish people to Palestine, and Zionism, which aims at this national reconstruction, will become an absurdity. A new system of colonization is therefore called for, a system which will be able to take care of itself and which will not become entangled in the factious and complex interests which now predominate in Palestine. Such a system, aiming at the rational, efficient and economical colonization of Palestine, is hereby submitted under the name of the unit system. Definition of the unit system the adoption of the unit system is based on the primary consideration that colonization shall not be carried on by the settlement in the new country of a series of individuals economically unrelated. Colonization must be made by large successive bodies or units of individuals comprising an economic entity which shall, as far as is physically possible, achieve independence. The word independence is here used in its widest sense. It does not merely mean that the unit and the individuals of which it is composed shall be able to live by the fruits of their labor, but that efforts of the unit shall be directed towards self-establishment as a self-sustaining body, 
producing as far as is possible its own necessaries within its own organization. This is the first and most important distinction. As we have seen, plans for colonization have not hitherto dealt with a number of immigrants who shall constitute a colonizing unit, a body meeting its own needs by its own production. The custom has been to plan the settlement of individuals and small enterprises, producing very little for their own consumption, but almost entirely for outside markets. Under this system, we have seen how the small and independent undertaking has been made almost impossible, the colonizer paying from the very beginning a heavy tribute to other industries, local and foreign, both in his installation and equipment and in the meeting of his current needs. As a small retailer, he was forced to pay retail prices which were ruinous, but as a part of a large unit, which works only for itself, at factory prices, he is no longer burdened with this crippling handicap. The unit system is therefore based on the rigid conception that a colonization unit must make it a primary duty to settle its individuals in the country in such wise that they shall themselves produce the necessary minimum for their own sustenance in food, clothing and shelter. Only when this condition shall have been met shall consideration of the production for the purposes of barter be taken into account and the first of such surplus production shall be directed to the repayment of the cost of colonization and organization. In other words, the unit is conceived as a great industrial organization working first to support its individuals by the direct production of all the necessaries of life, and second to repay the cost of installation that is, to repay the capital which was advanced by the Jewish people for its foundation. The system, therefore, has in view first the incalculable advantage of a Palestinian yeshub, which under the most adverse circumstances shall at least be able to provide for its own existence, and second, the equal advantage of repayment for installation, so that colonization shall take the aspect not of a philanthropic institution, but of a healthy self-sustaining enterprise. From the economic point of view, the fundamental principle involved in a self-sustaining unit is defensive and not aggressive. Economy of the unit system the advantages of the unit system, reflected as they are in every stage of the colonizing problem, begin with considerations preceding the settlement of the colonizer in Palestine. The colonizing element on which the Zionist movement counts is of practically unlimited dimensions. In many parts of the old world, the Jewish population has been practically ruined, or at least reduced, to a condition which is a ready stimulant to emigration. Unfortunately, the condition which stimulates emigration also prevents it. These Jews have neither the money nor the credit to enable them to make their homes in Palestine. There is, of course, only one source from which credit can be expected, and that is the Zionist organization. But it has been shown that on the old system of colonization, with the individual settler and individual enterprise, the call which would be made on the Zionist movement would be an impossible one. The sum needed to settle a single family in Palestine, to provide it with the necessary initial capital to set up an agricultural industry and to live until the industry pays, is a considerable one. It is, as has been shown, an uncertain sum, increasing from month to month as colonization progresses, so that even the figure which would be fixed for today for the settlement of a single family would be utterly inadequate a year hence. But even accepting that figure as fixed, when multiplied by 20,000 to represent the settlement of 100,000 souls, it becomes a sum entirely disproportionate with the results achieved. Apart from this question of means, there is the question of the individual. 
The individual applicant for credit is unknown to the Zionist movement. His personal reliability and his productive capacity are unknown factors. Moreover, however reliable and capable he may be, the small industrial organization, with its high expense, its meager chances of success, its tremendous initial difficulties, and its uncertain market, might easily fail in the future as it has often failed in the past, and the result would be not only discouragement of the settler and of prospective settlers, but a drain on the goodwill of the Jewish people in the colonization of Palestine. Individual credits, then, are costly and uncertain. What is needed, and what is proposed under the unit system, is the granting of what is really a mass credit to the entire unit of colonization. With this system, the chances of return are increased by the maintenance of a mortgage on the property, i.e. capital provided for the unit and on the process by which this property or capital is exploited. This mortgage on the process means only the administration and organization of the unit to the best advantage of its members, who are the debtors, and therefore for the best advantage of the Jewish people at large, which is the creditor. Furthermore, a unit of immigration of a 100,000 individuals treated as an organized and self-contained body can be financed with a credit which is infinitely smaller than the sum which would be called for for the separate financing of 100,000 separate immigrants with their 20,000 separate enterprises. This advantage, coupled with the higher chances of return as outlined in the preceding paragraph, will constitute a powerful appeal for the necessary credit. End of Colonization of Palestine, the Unit System by Boris Katzman Read by Claudia Caldi A Drop of 4,000 Feet by Florence Miriam Bailey Our last mountain camp of the field season of 1906 was at 8,500 feet in the New Mexico Mogollons. Even in New Mexico, an 8,500-foot camp after the middle of October is apt to be a trifle chilly, so we pitched our tents on the warm slope of the canyon under the yellow pines, laying logs against the outside walls of the tents to keep out the wind, and noting with satisfaction that there was abundant fuel close at hand for big campfires. A few rods below the tents, Willow Creek, a clear, sparkling mountain brook that heads the middle fork of the Gila, ran at the foot of a handsome fir and spruce wall whose crest at sunset caught the last yellow light slanting across the forest. In the morning, when the sun reached the trees in front of the tent, small voices would be heard, and a flock of hardy mountaineers, chickadees, pygmy nuthatches, and brown creepers, would fly in, filling the air with their gentle talk. Beyond camp, up the narrow winding gulch of Willow Creek, along which was kept a line of small mammal traps, in the sunny bends of a morning, chestnut-backed bluebirds and Audubon warblers would fly before us, and flocks of juncos rise with a startled twitter and a flash of white outer tail feathers. Some of the juncos, when flying, showed a band of pink along the sides, and as was proved when our specimens reached the biological survey, representatives of nearly every resident, migrant, or wandering junco of those mountains, including the slate-colored, intermediate, Montana, pink-sided, ridgeways, and the gray-headed, had gathered in that particular gulch, or its neighborhood, on the approach of winter. It was such good hunting ground that a sharp-skinned hawk was taking advantage of it. A dusky grouse had been seen on the way into the mountains, recently made tracks were discovered on the bank of Willow Creek, and fresh sign was found later on the ridges above. But most of the birds had probably been killed off by the summer hunting. The wild turkeys that were left in the mountains doubtless went below to escape the storms, for no tracks were seen except when we first reached Willow Creek, and some prospectors who came up the Gila told us that they had encountered a large number below, including bronze-colored gobblers. Well protected by their fur coats, small mammals were plentiful. 
Twenty-four specimens were found in the line of traps along the gulch one morning, including a shrew and various small mice and wood rats, while saucy red squirrels scolded us from the evergreen tops over the brook. And one day, when camp was quiet, two handsome gray abert squirrels with long winter ear tufts chased each other around and around a yellow pine trunk. Attracted perhaps by the abundance of small mammals were several hawks and owls. A sparrow hawk, three red tails, one a very black melanistic bird, a pygmy owl, and a pair of spotted owls. The spotted owls apparently made their home in the firs and spruces on the wall of Willow Creek, for their curious varied calls were heard at camp nearly every night, often just at daybreak, and once before dark. So different from the horned owl that it was noticed by the camp man. He's not the owl that makes that hootin' noise, the puzzled listener asked. On moonlight nights, the two birds were heard answering each other, a soft conversational hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo being replied to by a sharp wick, 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 wick. One of the commonest calls was a short bark, and another was hoo-hoo-hoo. The last hoo brought out with great emphasis. When some new calls from the varied repertoire of Strix were heard, the man looked up. That ain't the kind of tune he played the other night, is it? he asked. And then, as the concert continued, what makes him make such a noise? I should think he'd scare away all his game. In the daytime, flocks of striped pine siskins, on two days a band of probably a hundred birds, wandered up and down the creek, now in a compact flock, now straggling out, stopping to visit the cone-laden spruce tops, then going on to the alders where, bending over the little cones, they showed their yellow wing bands, then up and away giving their lovely Aeolian call on the wing. The unmistakable welcome notes of a flock of crossbills were also heard in the canyon. Robins, ruby kinglets, long-crested jays, and a number of woodpeckers were seen in the region. Borings, apparently of the pileated, were found in the timber from 8,500 to 9,600 feet, and the alpine three-toed woodpecker was found at 10,500 feet. At about 11,000 feet, a Cassin's finch was shot. While we were absorbed in watching the birds and beasts of the canyon, heavy winds and black clouds gathering around the mountaintops were followed by snow, and a Clark's crow came down from the peaks to the treetops above camp. The next morning, ice was an inch thick on the water pail, and in the cold, dark canyon, one pool was frozen so deep that it held the weight of a man. By some open water, an oozel stood on a stone with its feathers fluffed up. But though looking cold, it flew down into the water, hopped out onto a cake of ice, and stood there as unconcernedly as if on a sun-warmed rock. More snow fell, and it kept getting colder, till on the morning of the 24th of October, the day after the last thrush was seen, the mercury stood at 14 degrees Fahrenheit by our camp thermometer, which registered so little below that the temperature was probably nearer zero. That day, Mr. Bailey ran his own line to the top of the 11,000-foot peak above us and saw white-tailed deer and followed tracks of a mountain lion through the snow. Down in camp, it was cold work writing up notes, even with big logs blazing in front of the tent. When the snowstorms had cleared the sky, we had glorious days. The air was as clean and strong as on a mountain top, and the sky such a deep dark blue it was hard to keep one's eyes on the ground. At night, in the evergreen openings, the moonlight on the snow was doubly good to look at in New Mexico, and revived memories of beautiful white northern winters. But soon a second storm began gathering around the peaks, black clouds hanging low over them, and wind whistling through the spruces. If we stayed till the storm came, we might get snowed in. It was now the last of October, and the forest ranger at Mogollon had said that it was, quote, generally hard to get in or out of this country after the 1st of November, unquote, that sometimes the snow was seven feet deep here. To provide against trouble, he had given us the key to a cabin two miles below that held emergency supplies, but we were not prepared for winter, and having no snowshoes, if caught by a storm, might have to wade 17 miles through the snow. We decided to go out while we could drive out. Breaking camp in a cold rain, we climbed 500 feet up a steep wet trail to the top of the canyon and the wagon road, and the next morning, after driving across long miles of a road recognized as fit only for pack trains, 
went down 2,600 feet on a steep, slippery lumber grade to the mining town of Mogollon, near which we spent the night. The following morning climbing to 450 feet and then dropping down the 1,500-foot Mogollon grade across the rocky face of the bare southwest slope of the mountains, a striking contrast to the heavily timbered northeast slope from which we had come. We finally reached the stage station of Glenwood at the junction of Whitewater Creek with the San Francisco River. We had come down 4,000 feet in 28 hours, from 9,000 feet at the top of Willow Creek Canyon to 5,000 feet at the foot of the Mogollon Mountains. After rattling down the cold mountain grades, we were glad to camp here for a few days' work, pitching our tents in a little amphitheater that was warm and still, and filled with sunny nut pines and junipers. Bordering the river below us were glistening live oaks and broad-leafed cottonwoods that glowed with a lovely languorous yellow in the warm afternoon sunshine, while cobwebs floated on the quiet air and the gentle voices of lowland quail made sweet music. Looking back up the Mogollons, storm clouds shrouding the peaks made us thankful that we had escaped in time. It was pleasanter to sit safe and warm below and watch the pink sunset light on the mountains than to be wading in seven feet of snow. The grasshoppers are squeaking up on the hill, someone called out, and after a moment, the camp man's deliberate voice responded dryly, We didn't hear many over on Willow Crick. From listening to spotted owls barking from the moonlit firs and spruces of the snow-covered Canadian canyon above, we now listen to sonoran bush tits and gambles quail among the nut pines and junipers. A flock of the quail roosted not far from our tent in the protected amphitheater, and when gathering in and getting settled at dusk, above the variously accented calls, rose one in anxious, high-pitched tones, drolly like a distracted voice, calling, "'Where are you now? Where are you now?' Soon after daylight, hearing small voices approaching and raising our heads from our sleeping bags, we saw an advancing procession of the plump quail with recurved top nuts over their bills, their black throats and buffy belly patches conspicuous as they faced us. On they came, talking in low tones, but suddenly a warning tut-tut interrupted their conversation. They had discovered the cook at his campfire. A few steps more and they stopped, standing in two pretty squads under the junipers. Just over the bank, another flock of about twenty-five quail were flushed from a field bordering the San Francisco, the Rio San Francisco, which we had forded fifty-two times in one canyon a few weeks before. Following up the banks of the river, we found meadowlarks, killdeer, and ravens, and spoke with an old hunter going to a pond back of the dam for teal. But then we came to a canyon where the swift stream with its usual disregard of travelers was swinging against one and then the other of its sheer walls. So we turned off into a dry gulch. The gulch proved to be richly wooded with sycamore, ash, box elder, cottonwood, mulberry, live oak, and soapberry, and was so full of birds that it was hard to leave. There were woodhouse jays squawking, a little Texas woodpecker with barred back giving its shrill call as it drilled on the oaks, Audubon warblers jerking out their little sharp thwack, gray titmice whistling, and fascinating little bridal titmice flitting about the trees singing a tinkling chickadee song, while invisible canyon towhees, rock wrens, and a scott sparrow kept us peering up the stony banks of the gulch. On a mesquite flat above the gulch, pippets from the peaks were seen. We had left the snowy Canadian mountains deserted by all but a few of the hardier birds, and by our 4,000-foot drop, paralleling the vertical migration, had come down into the warm Sonoran Valley, where the weeds were still full of seeds, and the trees of berries, and the birds were gathered in happy throngs. They were everywhere. The air was full of their calls and fall songs, and wherever you went, from weed, bush, and tree, they flew before you. The weed patches were rustling with juncos, chewinks, and sparrows, song and white crowns. No white crowns had been seen on Willow Creek after the first snowstorm, and only one song sparrow had been heard. The junipers and nut pines were full of talkative bush tits, chattering ruby kinglets, sometimes giving a snatch of song, and house finches and bewick wrens singing gaily. What a clear, loud, ringing song the wren has! 
bluebirds, bardi, were seen on all sides. There were robins, morning doves, flickers, horned larks, says phoebe, canyon wrens, flocks of goldfinches and redwings, and a variety of hawks, red-tailed, sparrow, sharp-skinned, and marsh, while solitaires whistled a clear one-syllable hip, 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 and on warm days gave their full fall song. Brown creepers were seen 3,500 feet lower than they had been noted a few days before, and one was actually found on a lower Sonoran mesquite instead of his native Canadian fir and spruce. A small flock of siskins also reminded us of Willow Creek, but instead of cone seeds, they were eating sunflower seeds. Ignorant of the fact that most of the birds had left the mountains, a boy whom we saw was planning a hunting trip to them with a freighter. He was going to take one burrow just for ammunition, he boasted, for he shot everything he saw down to snowbirds. On the freight road, our attention was attracted to a dooryard with a flagpole flying an American flag, unusual in rural New Mexico, and still more surprising, two stuffed white-faced glossy ibises perched on the fence. Inside the house, we were pleased to find a family of Germans. The ibises, together with a blue heron, which stood on the parlor mantelpiece, had been shot along the river, which added to our list of valley species. The apologetic taxidermist said the birds were so handsome she wanted to save them, and having nothing better had put them up with tobacco and camphor gum, making eyes for the ibises with black buttons and yellow satin. At the next stage station, Lee's Station, a ranch just below the juniper and nut pine slopes of the mountains to which the wild turkeys come, the old man Lee, who kept tame turkeys, told us of an amusing experience he had had the previous night. He had gone up the gulch back of his house, and while there had seen an old gobbler, and thought he'd drive him home. But when approached, the turkey ran away from home, and when chased, got up and flew. Surprised at this strange behavior, the old man went on down to the ranch. Passing his hen house, he looked in, and there was his gobbler inside, perhaps the turkey he had chased was one whose tracks we had seen on Willow Creek. End of A Drop of 4,000 Feet by Florence Miriam Bailey Edmund Campion, Letter to the Lords of Her Majesty's Privy Council, 1580. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the Right Honorable, the Lords of Her Majesty's Privy Council, Right Honorable, whereas I have come out of Germany and Bomaland, being sent by my superiors, and adventured myself into this noble realm, my dear country, for the glory of God and benefit of souls, I thought it like enough that in this busy, watchful, and suspicious world, I should either sooner or later be intercepted and stopped of my course. Wherefore, providing for all events, and uncertain what may become of me, when God shall happily deliver my body into durance, I supposed it needful to put this writing in a readiness, desiring your good lordships to give it ye reading, or to know my cause. This doing, I trust, I shall ease you of some labor. For that which otherwise you must have sought for by practice of wit, I do now lay into your hands by plain confession. And ye intent that the whole matter may be conceived in order, and so the better both understood and remembered. I make thereof these nine points or articles, directly, truly, and resolutely opening my full enterprise and purpose. 1. I confess that I am, albeit unworthy, a priest of ye Catholic Church, and through ye great mercy of God, vowed now these eight years into the religion of the Society of Jesus. Hereby I have taken upon me a special kind of warfare under the banner of obedience, and eke resigned all my interest or possibility of wealth, honor, pleasure, and other worldly felicity. 2. At the voice of our general provost, which is to me a warrant from heaven, and oracle of Christ, I took my voyage from Prague to Rome, where our said general father is always resident, and from Rome to England, 
as I might and would have done joyously into any part of Christendom or heathenness, had I been thereto assigned. 3. My charge is of free cost to preach the gospel, to minister the sacraments, to instruct the simple, to reform sinners, to confute errors, in brief, to cry alarm spiritual against foul vice and proud ignorance, wherewith many my dear countrymen are abused. 4. I never had mind, and am strictly forbidden by our Father that sent me, to deal in any respect with matter of state or policy of this realm, as things which appertain not to my vocation, and from which I do gladly restrain and sequester my thoughts. 5. I do ask, to the glory of God, with all humility, and under your correction, three sorts of indifferent and quiet audiences. The first before your honors, wherein I will discourse of religion, so far as it touches the common weal and your nobilities. The second, whereof I make more account before the doctors and masters and chosen men of both universities, wherein I undertake to avow the faith of our Catholic Church by proofs innumerable, scriptures, councils, fathers, history, natural and moral reasons. The third, before the lawyers, spiritual and temporal, wherein I will justify the said faith by the common wisdom of the laws standing yet in force and practice. 6. I would be loath to speak anything that might sound of any insolent brag or challenge, especially being now as a dead man to this world, and willing to put my head under every man's foot, and to kiss the ground they tread upon. Yet have I such a courage in avouching the majesty of Jesus my King, and such affiance in his gracious favor, and such assurance in my quarrel, and my evidence so impregnable, and because I know perfectly that no one Protestant, nor all the Protestants living, nor any sect of our adversaries, howsoever they face men down in pulpits and overrule us in their kingdom of grammarians and unlearned ears, can maintain their doctrine in disputation. I am to sue most humbly and instantly for the combat with all and every of them, and the most principle that may be found, protesting that in this trial the better furnished they come, the better welcome they shall be. 7. And because it hath pleased God to enrich the Queen my Sovereign Lady with notable gifts of nature, learning, and princely education, I do verily trust that, if Her Highness would vouchsafe her royal person and good attention to such a conference as, in the second part of my fifth article I have motioned, or to a few sermons, which in her or your hearing I am to utter, such manifest and fair light by good method and plain dealing may be cast upon these controversies, that possibly her zeal of truth and love of her people shall incline her noble grace to disfavor some proceedings hurtful to the realm, and procure toward us oppressed more equity. 8. Moreover, I doubt not, but you, Her Highness's counsel, being of such wisdom and discreet in cases most important, when you shall have heard these questions of religion opened faithfully, which many times by our adversaries are huddled up and confounded, will see upon what substantial grounds our Catholic faith is builded, how feeble that side is which by sway of the time prevaileth against us. And so at last for your own souls, and for many thousand souls that depend upon your government, will discountenance error when it is bereaved, and hearken to those who would spend the best blood in their bodies for your salvation. Many innocent hands are lifted up to heaven for you daily by those English students, whose posterity shall never die, which beyond seas gathering virtue and sufficient knowledge for the purpose, are determined never to give you over, but either to win you heaven or to die upon your pikes. And touching our society, be it known to you that we have made a league, all the Jesuits in the world, whose succession and multitude must overreach all the practices of England, cheerfully to carry the cross you shall lay upon us, and never to despair your recovery, 
while we have a man left to enjoy your Tyburn, or to be racked with your torments, or consumed with your prisons. The expense is reckoned. The enterprise is begun. It is of God. It cannot be withstood. So the faith was planted, so it must be restored. 9. If these my offers be refused, and my endeavors can take no place, and I, having run thousands of miles to do you good, shall be rewarded with rigor, I have no more to say but to recommend your case and mine to Almighty God, the searcher of hearts, who sends us his grace, and set us at accord before the day of payment, to the end we may at last be friends in heaven, when all injuries shall be forgotten. End of Edmund Campion Letter to the Lords of Her Majesty's Privy Council, 1580
he said must advisedly. End of Good Looking Teachers Get Best Results Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson The Effects of the Weather Upon Death Rate and Crime in India by S. A. Hill Printed in Nature, February 7, 1884 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey The Effects of the Weather Upon Death Rate and Crime in India Some time ago, a very interesting series of articles by Mr. Buchan upon the connection between certain meteorological conditions and the zymotic diseases, as illustrated by the mortuary returns of the London district, appeared in Nature. Happening to have undertaken at the request of the Provincial Superintendent of Census Operations, certain investigations concerning the life statistics of the population of the northwest provinces of Oud, just about the time when Mr. Buchan's articles appeared, it occurred to me that it would be worth while to see whether any similar concomitant variations of meteorological conditions and causes of death could be detected in India. The results arrived at are so curious, and at the same time so definite, that I think they may be of interest to readers of this journal. At starting, however, it should be observed that, though the mortuary returns of the province with which I am connected are probably the best in India, they are still very far from complete. The agency employed for registration is that of the village Chokadar, or watchman, who is supposed to take note of all births and deaths which occur in his village, aiding his memory if necessary by variously cut notches on a stick, and to report these weekly at the nearest police station. From such an agency nothing like an exact account of the causes of death can be expected. Hence in the detailed tables given below I have confined my attention to the four most obvious causes, smallpox, cholera, suicide, and wounds. Even as regards the number of deaths registered, a considerable defect may confidently be anticipated, owing to lapses of memory on the part of the Chokadar. This defect has been found by Dr. Plock, the sanitary commissioner, to amount to about 20% of the whole on the average of a large number of cases personally examined by him in various parts of the province. The proportion thus obtained is confirmed by the comparison of the deaths actually registered with the death rate arrived at in the last census report. During the five years, 1878-82, the only ones for which complete returns are obtainable, the deaths registered appear from figures supplied by Dr. Plork to have numbered 7,311,013, the average population during the five years having been about 45 million. This gives an annual death rate of 32.5 per thousand. Now, in Mr. White's report on the census of 1881, it is shown that the distribution of the population according to age and the observed death rate among certain tribes and castes suspected of practicing infanticide and therefore placed under strict police surveillance point to 40 per mil as a probable rate of mortality for the general population. The unrecorded deaths, therefore, amount on the average of 7.5 out of 40, or 19% of the total, almost exactly the same defect as Dr. Plork arrived at by his personal investigation on the special cases. It follows that, through the returns collected by the rude illiterate agency, employed and not strictly accurate, the total is arrived at probably on the whole bear a nearly constant proportion to the true number of deaths the population dealt with being sufficiently numerous to eliminate any individual peculiarities of the agents. The death rate varies enormously from year to year, as may be seen from the table of the total number of deaths recorded here given in full. The table is displayed on the page, number of deaths from all causes registered in the northwest provinces and owed during the five years, 1878 to 82. The deaths recorded average a little under a million and a half per annum, but in 1880 they were less than a million, and in 1879 nearly two millions. In that disastrous year, one district or county, that of Aligar, lost nearly half a million of its population. The chief difference between 1879 and 1880, from the meteorological point of view, was that in 1879 the monsoon rains were unusually heavy, 
while in 1880 they were so scanty that for a long time grave apprehensions were entertained of another famine, like that which followed the drought of 1877. The year 1877, which does not appear in the table, was an extraordinary healthy one, but the effect of the scarcity produced by the drought of that year is seen in the high mortality of the first six months of 1878. The first rough generalization suggested by the table is that dry years are healthy and wet ones unhealthy. That is generally true is well known to residents in the country. Among the natives also I have heard it said that one must choose between health plus famine and abundance plus fever. It would nevertheless be false to infer that in India mortality is due to rain, for we have only to compare the figures for the several months to see that on average, and almost every single year, the month with fewest deaths occurs July which happens to be just the rainiest month of the twelve. Rain is no doubt one of the indirect causes of death, but it seems to produce unhealthy effects by increasing the humidity of the air and hastening the growth of rank vegetation, which decaying at a time of the year when the air is almost perfectly still over the Indian plains, produces that noxious condition of the lower atmospheric strata known by the name malaria. Compared with the deaths from malarial fevers, those due to cholera, smallpox, and other epidemics count almost as nothing. Hence, though these epidemics have their particular seasons of maximum and minimum, their effect is completely hidden in the general mortality table under the great annual variation which culminates in October and November. Besides rainfall, atmospheric humidity and wind velocity, other meteorological causes which presumably have some effect upon health are the mean temperature and the daily range of temperature. The last, according to the prevalent opinion amongst Indian medical men, who are fond of attributing almost every ailment to nocturnal chills, being a most important cause. The next table gives approximate monthly mean values of all those meteorological elements for the northwest provinces and Od, exclusive of the Himalayan districts, which are very sparsely populated. The table is displayed on the page. Mean values of certain climatological factors in the northwest provinces and Od. Before proceeding to estimate the relative effects of these factors upon the death rate, it will be found convenient to convert the totals given in the first table into mean rates per annum. The mean number of deaths per annum for each million of population is 32,493, and this number is distributed over the months as follows when the months are all reduced to the same length. January 2,351 February 2,201 March 2,093 April 2480, May 2397, June 2181, July 1855, August 2435, September 3040, October 4352, November 4083, December 3025. It has already been pointed out that the effect of the rainfall upon health is very indirect and therefore need not be taken into account here. The relative effects of the other factors in the second table may be calculated approximately by the formula D equals alpha T plus beta R plus Y H plus delta V. Here D, T, R, H and V respectively denote the variations of the death rate, the mean temperature, the range of temperature, the relative humidity and the wind velocity from each month from their mean annual values. From the 12 equations of this form, furnished by the monthly means, we get the following most probable values for the coefficient, viz. Alpha equals 79.7, Y equals 43.4, Beta equals 113.6, Delta equals minus 35.6. If there be any approach to truth in the assumed proportionality between the variations of the death rate and of these climatological elements, it therefore appears that a mere rise of temperature within the limits observed produced comparatively little effect, one degree of increase in the mean temperature, increasing the deaths about 80 million per month, or rather less than one per thousand per annum. The variations of the diurnal range have a much greater effect, while the change in the death rate due to varying humidity is even less than that due to temperature changes. The relation between the death rate and the movement of the wind is inverse. 
the proportionate increase of deaths being 35.6 per million per month for a decrease in the velocity of the wind amounting to only one mile in 24 hours. In the months of October and November, when so-called malarial diseases attain their maximum, the air is almost absolutely still, and there can be little doubt that if a moderate breeze were occasionally to spring up at this time of the year, so as to dissipate the malaria, or at all events mix it with good air from other districts or from above, the effect would be an immediate decrease of the death rate. As regards special causes of death, I have already stated that I have confined my attention to those cases in which the chokadar may be trusted to make a correct diagnosis. Smallpox, a disease now happily almost banished from Europe, but still carrying off many thousands of victims annually in India, is one of these almost unmistakable causes. The average number of deaths from this disease during the five years was 59,240, distributed as follows. A small table is displayed on the page. January, 3,195. February, 3,830. March, 6,611. April 12,561, May 13,790, June 9,140, July 4,855, August 1,922, September 742, October 366, November 536, December 1,690. The deaths from this cause, numerous as they are, are fewest in the months when the general mortality attains its maximum. The meteorological causes which favour the spread of smallpox appear to be heat, drought and possibly also an unusually high wind velocity. The solid particles which constitute the contagion being presumably blown about by the wind. The relative effects of these may be roughly computed from the totals for each quarter, using the formula. A math formula is displayed on the page. N equals Product plus alpha t plus beta 100 minus h plus y v. N being the record number of deaths in any month, and the number that would occur under the hypothetical conditions of a still saturated atmosphere at 0 degrees Fahrenheit, and t, h and v standing for the temperature, humidity and wind velocity respectively. The coefficients thus found are a equals 91, b equals 237, y equals 97. The condition most favourable to the propagation of smallpox appearing therefore to be dryness. The number n for the unattainable conditions assumed comes out negative. Another disease which the village watchman may be trusted to recognise in most instances is cholera. Cases of severe diarrhoea are doubtless frequently returned as cholera, but this does not sensibly impair the value of the registers since the two diseases are usually prevalent about the same time. The mortality from cholera is subject to an annual variation quite as distinct as that of smallpox, but there are two maxima, in April and August, with a slight diminution between these months. The averages for the five years are January 317, February 338, March 1304, April 9027, May 6541, June 6344, July 5735, August 8129, September 4839, October 4665, November 1514, December 426. From the records of the Army, Police and Jail Departments, extending over a longer series of years, it appears that the maximum mortality from cholera usually occurs in the rainy season. The secondary maximum in April becomes the principal one in this table on account of the excessive prevalence of cholera in April 1880. This epidemic was popularly attributed to the immense number of Hindu pilgrims assembled at the great religious fair of Hadwar, the disease having been caught from some infected persons in the crowd and spread abroad over the country as the pilgrims returned to their homes. The sanitary commissioner with the government of India, however, does not accept this view, but seems to attribute the disease or its dissemination to some occult atmospheric influence. Whatever may ultimately prove to be the nature of the disease, there can be little doubt that in the northwest provinces it is to a great extent dependent upon heat and moisture, been almost unknown in the cooler months of the dry season. To estimate the relative effects of these two atmospheric conditions, we may employ the formula. N equals product plus alpha T plus beta H. The letters having similar significations to those mentioned with the previous formula. Combining the months in groups of four, commencing with December, 
we get three equations which give the following approximate results. Alpha equals 281, beta equals 45, product equals minus 20,076. The principal effect is that due to high temperature, or the temperature assumed from N0, Fahrenheit, that number comes out at negative, that is to say, in a perfectly dry atmosphere, cholera would disappear at a temperature considerably above freezing, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit in fact, if we may judge from these tables. In the cold weather months, indeed, cholera never assumes epidemic proportions in the northwest provinces. But when the poison, whatever it may be, is widely disseminated, as in the beginning of 1882, after the great Miller, or religious fair of Allahabad, it remains nearly quiescent, manifesting itself only in a few sporadic cases until the commencement of the hot weather in April, when it breaks forth with alarming rapidity. Deaths by violence are also, as a rule, unmistakable. In the sanitary commissioner's tables, two courses of death are given, which both come under this head. Suicide and wounds. The latter presumably including only the results of murder and manslaughter, as there are separate headings for accidents and wild beasts. The average numbers of these deaths recorded each year are A table is displayed on the page comparing suicide and wounds to months. January Suicide 105, wounds 105, total 210. February Suicide 109, wounds 94, total 203. March Suicide 196, wounds 105, total 301. April Suicide 268, wounds 119, total 387. May Suicide 246, wounds 125, total 371. June, suicide 248, wounds 128, total 376. July, suicides 246, wounds 132, total 378. August, suicides 242, wounds 154, total 395. September, suicides 269, wounds 145, total 414. October, suicides 250, wounds 135, Total 385. November, suicides 151, wounds 115, total 266. December, December, suicides 100, wounds 98, total 193. Both series exhibit a distinct annual variation, notwithstanding some irregularities which would probably disappear if we had larger numbers to deal with, and in both the phases are similar the minimum being reached in the middle of the cold weather and the maximum in the hot season and rains. Both forms of death by violence are, in fact, manifestations of the same cause. Irritability of temper for suicides in India are, as a rule, not the result of a fixed melancholia, three-fourths of the cases being those of young married women who, finding life unbearable under the daily and hourly sting of the mother-in-law's tongue, ended at last by jumping down a well. The monthly totals given in the last table may be approximately represented by the formula product equals alpha multiplied by t minus x plus beta multiplied by h. Since they seem to depend both on temperature and humidity, in this formula x would be the temperature which crimes of violence would disappear. Grouping the months in fours, commencing with November, we get three equations which give alpha equals 7.2 beta equals 2.0, and x equals 48.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Crimes of violence in India may therefore be said to be proportional in frequency to the tendency to prickly heat, that excruciating condition of the skin induced by a high temperature combined with moisture. Anyone who has suffered from this ailment and knows how it affected his temper will readily understand how the conditions which produce it may sometimes lead to homicide and other crimes. And anyone who has been in India in the cold weather and seen to what an abject condition the ordinary native is reduced by a temperature of 60 degrees or so can believe that there is probably some truth in the arithmetical result above given. That about 48 degrees, crimes of violence would disappear for such a temperature no one would possess a sufficient store of energy to enable him to commit crime of any graver description than petty larceny. S.A. Hill End of the Effects of the Weather Upon Death Rate and Crime in India Recorded by Leon Harvey
english animals in snow by charles john cornish this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the white horse downs as the first snow fell this year gently steadily and by day instead of rushing upon us in a midnight storm the sheep not waiting until it pleased the snow demon either to bury them or to pass on to mischief elsewhere drew together facing the wind and stamped the snow down incessantly as it fell just as they stamp their feet when facing a strange dog but far more rapidly and continuously some of them were lambs of the year that had never seen a snowfall yet these creatures so long domesticated untaught by experience were by instinct using the same means to combat the snow their greatest enemy as does the wild moose in the canadian backwoods the moose would perish like the sheep in the drifts if the herds did not combine to trample out the moose yards and these sturdy south downs were showing exactly the same instinct in an english park but snow generally catches our animals unprepared all but the hedgehog who is comfortably asleep rolled up in a coat of leaves and they are put to all kinds of shifts to find food and escape their enemies the more open and exposed the districts the greater their difficulties where there are thick woods and hedgerows and above all running water birds and beasts alike can find dry earth in which to peck and scratch or green things to nibble and water to drink but on the great chalk downs a heavy snowstorm seems to drive from the open country every living creature that dares to move at all for the first day after a heavy fall the hares which allow the snow to cover them all but a tiny hole made by their warm breath do not stir only towards noon if the sun shines out they make a small opening to face its beams and perhaps another in the afternoon at a different angle to the surface to catch the last slanting rays walking across the fields after a violent snowstorm in january the writer stepped on a hare though the field showed one level stretch of driven snow and later in the day from the brow of a steep narrow valley the sun holes made by the hares were easily marked on the opposite ridge four or five were discovered in this way and on disturbing them it was found that each had its two windows one facing the south the second and longer tunnel pointing further to the west and at a sharper angle to the surface but hunger soon forces the hares to leave their snug snow-house in the bitter nights as the icy wind sweeps through the thin beech copses on the downs and piles up huge ice puddings of drifted snow and beech leaves they canter off down into the vale to eat the cabbages in the cottage gardens and nibble the turnips in the heaps open to feed the sheep in the straw yards squirrels which are often supposed to hibernate only retire to their nests in very severe and prolonged frosts a slight fall of snow only amuses them and they will come down from their trees and scamper over the powdery heaps with immense enjoyment what they do not like is the snow on the leaves and branches which falls in showers as they jump from tree to tree 
and betrays them to their enemies the country boys during a mild winter they even neglect to make a central store of nuts and instead of storing them in big hoards near the nest just drop them into any convenient hole they know of near a pair took possession of an old well-timbered garden in berkshire and when they found out as they very soon did that they were not to be disturbed continued during the mild open weather to exhibit a reckless improvidence quite at variance with squirrel tradition in october they stripped the old nut trees but flung the greater number of the nuts onto the ground later in the autumn they spent the greater part of each morning collecting and burying horse chestnuts not in any proper store but in all sorts of places among the roots of rose bushes under the palings of the lawn or in the turf under a big tulip tree almost every knot hole in the trees of the orchard and walks had a chestnut or walnut poked into it but there was no attempt to bring them together for a cold weather magazine and they even had the impudence to dig up crocus bulbs under the windows and leave them scattered over the lawn then came the snow and the improvident squirrels had to set to work at once and call in all these scattered investments at an alarming sacrifice for the nut hatchers very soon found out their carelessly hidden property and made off with it fortunately the snow soon melted or they might have been reduced to short rations like the squirrels rabbits seem rather to enjoy the snow at first like many men they require a dry bracing atmosphere and sea breezes and frost suit them and the morning after a snowfall their tracks show where they have been scratching and playing in it all night but after a deep fall they are soon in danger of starving though not particular as to quality they like their meals regular and with all the grass covered with a foot of snow their main supply of food is cut off if there is a turnip field near they will scratch away the snow to the roots and soon destroy the crop if not or if the surface of the snow is frozen hard the hungry bunnies strip the bark from the trees and bushes in the long frost of february eighteen eighty eight we saw nothing but bare white wood in the fences near the warrens ivy bark seemed their favourite food and even the older stems were stripped making a white network against the trunks of the big trees even these did not quite escape for though the lower bark was too hard and dry even for the rabbits broken limbs of a foot in diameter smashed by the weight of snow were peeled to the bare wood in some places the rabbits had first stripped the bark from the lower part of a clipped thorn fence then mounted to the top and nibbled the shoots and lastly using the thick top as a seat had nibbled the ivy bark from the trees in the hedgerow eight feet from the ground it is easy to guess what damage the starving rabbits do in young plantations if the drifted snow enables them to scramble over the wire fencing when snow melts on the grass any one may notice a number of dead frozen earthworms lying on the flattened sward this may account for a habit which moles have of working just between the earth and snow when the thaw comes the lower half of the burrow may be seen for yards along the surface of the ground unless the upper crust was frozen before the snow fell 
while all the harmless animals are obliged to spend the greater part of the day and night seeking food their enemies profit exceedingly the stoats and weasels find that they have only to prowl down the stream side to catch any number of thrushes and soft-billed birds which crowd the banks where the water melts the snow and little piles of feathers and a drop or two of red on the snow show where the fierce little beasts have murdered here a red wing and there a wagtail or even a water hen the tracks show well their method of hunting once we followed the tracks of a fox for a long distance from a large earth on the downs he had begun by visiting a farm near going round all the ricks and then close to the house apparently he had been frightened for he had gone off at a gallop then after keeping along a high steep bank where there was a chance of finding a lark roosting in the rough grass at the edge he had diverged to examine a patch of dead nettles which had sprung up round a weed heap next he had gone off for half a mile in a straight line to a barn and there after examining every bush and straw rick had caught a rat or a mouse and then gone off into the vale not far off was his return track he had gone a short distance on the track of a hare but apparently had found a good supper before then for in a few yards he had abandoned the trail and gone straight back to the earth the same day we found the traces of a tragedy in rabbit life the footmarks of several bunnies just outside a thick break the traces of a fox creeping cautiously up the hedgerow between them and their earths and the fox's rush from the bushes ending in a broad mark in the snow where a rabbit had been seized leaving only a few bits of grey hair scattered about as memorials for his family walking along the road through the flat meadows one snowy night we were startled by the noise of a covey of partridges rising and cackling the other side of the hedge a fox had sprung right among the covey but apparently missed his mark as the next moment he crossed the road in front of us water shrews water rats and otters all dislike frost and snow more perhaps because the streams are frozen and food more difficult to obtain along the banks than from any inconvenience the snow causes them the otters even if the rivers do not freeze have a difficulty in finding the fish which in cold weather sink to the deepest pools and in the case of eels tench and carp which form the main food of the otter in the slow rivers of the eastern and southeastern counties burrow in the mud so the otters go down to the sea coast for the cold weather and making their homes in the coast caves or old wooden jetties and wharves live on the dabs and flounders of the estuaries rats also often migrate to the coast in snow time and pick up a disreputable livelihood among the rubbish of the shore of all effects of weather snow makes the greatest change in animal economy in the countryside and weeks often pass before the old order is restored end of english animals in snow by charles john cornish executive order to eliminate woke anti-woman words from state government and respect women by the governor of the state of arkansas read by dale grothman this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Executive Order to Eliminate Woke, Anti-Woman Words from State Government and Respect Women. Whereas, women are women. Whereas, an XX chromosome is an XX chromosome. The science is clear and real. Whereas, there are things only women can do, like perform the miracle of birth. Whereas, the government should reject language that ignores, undermines, and erases women. Whereas, government should celebrate gender distinctions between men and women, not erase them. And, whereas, it is the policy of this administration to prohibit the use of woke, anti-woman words for official state government business now therefore i sarah huckabee sanders acting under the authority vested in me as the governor of the state of arkansas do hereby order one all state offices departments boards and commissions are prohibited from using exclusionary sexist language in official state government business, effective immediately. 2. In official government documents, the following exclusionary and sexist terms shall be replaced with accurate, female-affirming alternatives. a. Rather than pregnant people or pregnant person, use pregnant woman or pregnant mom. b rather than chest feeding use breast feeding c rather than body fed or person fed use breast fed d rather than human milk use breast milk e rather than birthing person use birth mom f rather than laboring person use birth mom g rather than menstruating person or menstruating people use woman or women h rather than birth giver use woman i rather than w o m x n or w o m y n use woman in testimony hereof, I have hitherto set my hand and caused the great seal of the state of Arkansas to be affixed this 19th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. End of Executive Order to Eliminate Woke, Anti-Woman Words from State Government and Respect Women, State of Arkansas. The Geographic Aspect of Culture by Stephen Elmer Slocum, Ph.D. Professor of Applied Mathematics, University of Cincinnati. The dynamic influence of geography in history has recently attracted general attention. The idea was developed from a philosophical standpoint by Hegel about the middle of the last century, but only recently has it come to be regarded as of special significance. In the light of the discoveries of Hedden and Huntington in Central Asia, However, there can be no doubt that the characteristics of primitive races are profoundly modified by environment. As an instance of this, Huntington has shown that the Kyrgyz nomads inhabiting the deserts and plateaus of the Lop Basin in Chinese Turkestan are forced to lead a roving life by reason of the scantiness of subsistence. This in turn limits their occupations to the manufacture of portable articles such as rugs and felts while it also accentuates certain characteristics such as hardihood and hospitality. In contrast to this type, the Chandos, inhabiting the oasis, are tied down to intensive agriculture, the effect of which is also distinctly apparent in their character and occupations. This is further intensified by the lack of sufficient rainfall, which in their case has imposed such a severe limitation upon increase of population as to have given rise to the institutions of monasticism and polyandry. The United States also furnishes a notable instance of the effect of physiographic environment. 
The colonization of America was in itself a matter of latitude, the tier of early colonies along the Atlantic seaboard following practically the same arrangement as their European prototypes. Again, the barriers of sea and mountain give coherence to the New England colonies, which, reinforced by favorable latitude, ripened the spirit of independence. Other natural features, such as the great river valleys and mountain passes, were instrumental in determining the great trade routes, as well as in shaping the campaigns of the Revolution and the Civil War. In connection with the topography, the related factor of climate is also of primary importance. In polar and tropical regions, as well as in certain other isolated sections, such as the deserts of Central Asia, is an absolute barrier to progress. Even in the most favoured localities, it has a marked effect upon the trend of social evolution. The invigorating effect is clear. Cold weather is commonly recognised, but it is equally true that excessive moisture depresses the vital processes and thereby hampers development, an effect strikingly exemplified in the case of Ireland. On the other hand, dry weather is efficiently prolonged, creates a surplus of energy, and at the same time weakens the emotional control, resulting, as shown by statistics, in a notable increase in misconduct and crime. Apparent not only locally in times of drought, but habitually in dry countries like Mexico. A remarkable synchronism of climatic changes has also been shown to exist throughout the world, recurring in cycles of approximately 36 years. In America, this has made itself felt in the Great Financial Crisis, each of which has been associated with the deficiency in rainfall occurring at the low point of one of these cycles. This, in turn, has reacted upon politics to such an extent as to be of national import. As yet, the study of geographic influences in history has related only to such external and obvious manifestations as are apparent in social, industrial and political development. It may be interesting, therefore, to point out how these results may be extended to include intellectual development. In any attempt of this kind, it is necessary, at the outset, to set up some universal and fundamental principle of thought to serve as a standard for comparison of racial traits, and an index of mentality, since racial traits become more distinct and divergent the more remote the period considered. Few principles are sufficiently general to answer this purpose. There is, however, at least one form of thought which has always been characteristic of the human mind, wherever historically manifested. Primitive culture, however remote, has always been accompanied by some form of mathematical reasoning. It is in fact noteworthy that all Oriental nations ascribe the origin of both their culture and their mathematics to a single personage whom they also regard as the founder of their race. With the Chinese, this was the Emperor Foyi whose reign about 2800 BC marked the beginning of Chinese history. As the Chinese have no earlier records to indicate the origin of their mathematics, their traditions relate to the number system, was revealed to this emperor inscribed on the back of a dragon, which rose from the waters of the Yellow River. In Egyptian history, the first historical personage is the King Means, who ruled somewhere between 5000 and 3000 BC and was the founder of the first dynasty of pharaohs. Here also, from lack of earlier records, the Egyptians regarded Means as the father of numbers, calculation and writing. Even such an enlightened and careful historian as Josephus relates that Abraham taught mathematics to the Jews, and instances might be multiplied to show that this idea is prevalent throughout history. The intimate connection of mathematics with early culture is further apparent in its relation to religion and philosophy. In Egypt, mathematics was the peculiar possession of the priesthood, and was guarded by them with the utmost jealousy. When it passed to the Greeks, it was made by them a prerequisite for philosophical study, their great philosophers being primarily mathematicians. At the beginning of the Christian era, mathematics again passed into the keeping of the priesthood, its preservation during the Dark Ages being due to the care with which it was preserved in Catholic monasteries. Even the Pope openly gave it the sanction of the Church, threatening Galileo with the Inquisition for his heretical astronomical doctrines, and refuting them by issuing a manifesto to the effect that the sun moves around the earth in accordance with the time-honoured Ptolemaic system. During the period of the Reformation, mathematics was regarded as one of the most powerful weapons of Protestantism, many noted mathematicians of the time devoting all their efforts to proving that Pope Leo X was the Antichrist mentioned in Revelation 13.18.
The history of mathematics begins in the valley plains of Egypt. On the borderline between the tropical and temperate zones, climate and soil were so adapted to the needs of primitive man as to force intellect to its earliest manifestation. As Aristotle expressed it, when pressing needs are satisfied, man turns to the general and more elevated. And consequently, as Hegel points out, the temperate zone is the true theatre of history, since where heat or cold are intense, external pressure is never relieved. As the rigours of climate lessened, the man attained a greater mastery over nature. These two factors conspired to force culture out of its primitive seat in the river valleys of the Nile, Tigris, and Euphrates towards the northwest, its northerly progress being determined by climatic changes, and its westerly course by topographical features. If the course of mathematical development is traced out on a physiographic and isothermal map, it will be clearly apparent not only that it has followed the lines of least resistance topographically, but that it has crossed successive isotherms in its northerly progress with great regularity, due, as has been suggested, to the increased need of the nervous system, as it becomes more complex from more bracing climate. The three chief geographic features which exhibit fundamental differences are valley, mountain and sea. In the valley plains of China, India, Babylonia and Egypt, the fertility of the soil assured a plentiful subsistence, while the regularity of the seasons, combined with landed values resulting from agriculture, gave rise to a fixed social relationship in more elevated regions, such as the plateaus of Africa and South America, and the steppes of Russia, the scarcity of subsistence necessitates a nomadic life. In this patriarchal form of existence, the size of the community is limited by the productiveness of the soil, as illustrated in Genesis 13, 5, 11. Fixed relationships are therefore unknown, and hence the political and social order called the state is impossible. Each of the great river valleys of antiquity developed an independent civilization. Egypt first, by reason of its tropical location, closely followed by China and the Tigro-Euphrates Basin, laying five degrees farther north. The beginnings of Chinese culture were equally promising with those of the great nations of antiquity. The art of writing was properly originated by the Chinese, while the elements of mathematics and astronomy, the art of printing and various manufacturers were known to them centuries before they reached Europe. The geographical isolation of China, however, put an effectual barrier to progress, resulting in a sort of inversion of character whereby reverence for precedent took the place of progressive development. As an instance of this inversion, it is related of one of the Chinese emperors that when he wished to confer honours upon his prime minister, he conferred them upon the minister's father. Chinese culture is petrified almost at the outset, and is therefore of no significance except as a case of arrested development, due largely, if not wholly, to geographic limitations. In contrast to China, the civilizations originating in the valleys of the Nile and Euphrates found a natural outlet eastward and northward by way of the Mediterranean. Here, culture in all its phases reflected the influence of the soil. Religion took the form of a gross nature worship, the divinities being the great rivers, the sun and moon, and other natural sources from which their physical wants were supplied, while arts and manufacturers were also limited to the practical and prosaic. In Egypt, the peculiar physical conditions presented by the annual overflow of the Nile led to the invention of surveying, out of necessity to the elements of arithmetic and geometry required to apply it. In architecture also, the effect to orient their temples gave rise to certain fundamental geometric theorems still in use, such as the properties of right-angled triangles, while in the art, the enlargement of small drawings or paintings for their temple walls was accomplished by means of a network of squares closely related to the modern Cartesian system of coordinates. The entire absence of rainfall and the consequent clearness of atmosphere also had an important effect in directing the attention of the Egyptians to the heavens, which, supplemented by the oriental use of the roof as a terrace, led to the study of astronomy. In Chaldea, the similarity of race and physical conditions to those in Egypt led to identical results. The earliest fragments of Chaldean literature disclosing a considerable knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, architecture, and various practical arts and manufacturers. The Assyrian temples were adjuncts of the palaces, and were also used as observatories, where the priestly astrologers consulted the stars and cast horoscopes. 
even before Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, that city possessed a royal observatory and a calendar. In short, action was based upon nature, although interpreted by each race in accordance with racial characteristics. Thus, with a more aesthetic people, and after all life under the clear skies of Judea found expression in the poetic description of the heavens embodied in the Hebrew Psalms, instead of in the practical astronomy which the Egyptians and Assyrians associated with their religion. Egypt and Assyria, said Lenormant, were the birthplaces of material civilization. The Phoenicians were its missionaries. This describes in brief the part taken by the Semitic race occupying the little strip of sea coast, 180 miles long by 12 broad, on the eastern littoral of the Mediterranean, is transmitting ancient civilization to Europe. Here again the geographical element was strongly apparent, both subjectively in their national culture and objectively in their relation to history. While the effect of mountain regions was to shut off such regions as Central Africa, Eastern Asia and Northern Europe from the great course of historical development, and that of the Great Valley Plains was to intensify human activity. The sea formed a bond of union, at the same time stimulated bravery, independence and breadth of vision. To this characteristic, difference between coastal and interior regions is due their frequent separation. As for example, Holland has separated itself from Germany and Portugal from Spain. The influence of the sea was especially apparent in the development of the nations surrounding the Mediterranean. Here were three continents, surrounding a sea of such shape as to afford a long coastline and of such width as to stimulate adventure. The effect was to make the Mediterranean the centre of world history. On its shores rose the great centres of civilization: Athens, Rome, Carthage and Alexandria, as well as of religious faith, Jerusalem, Mecca and Medina. The geographical location of Phoenicia, midway between Egypt, Assyria and Arabia, naturally made it first to develop commercial activity. From the rich commercial cities of Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians pushed out in all directions, settling in Cyprus, Sicily and Sardinia, founding Cadiz in Spain and Utica and Carthage in Africa. As early as 1500 BC, the Mediterranean was already the great highway of Phoenician commerce. Their vessels penetrating the eastern archipelago, the Hellespont and the Black Sea. When these avenues were closed to them by the Greeks in the 11th century BC, the Phoenician commerce turned westward, bringing silver from Tarshish to southern Spain, and even passing the pillars of Hercules and braving the perils of the Atlantic to bring tin from Britain and amber from the Baltic. In connection with their maritime trade, they also established great overland routes their caravans bringing gold from Ophir to southeastern Arabia and passing through Palamia, Baalbek, and Babylon, whence they penetrated all the east. Although Phoenicians were thus brought into intimate contact with all the great nations of antiquity, their culture was essentially different. Forced to rely upon the sea for their livelihood, they developed an industrious and hardy manhood in marked contrast to the dependent attitude characteristic of nations relying upon agriculture for their subsistence. In religion, the same contrast was apparent. The religion of the Egyptians and the Assyrians being a crude and sensuous idolatry, whereas the Phoenicians worshipped Hercules, a divinity whom the Greeks said raised himself to Olympus by virtue of his own courage and daring. In mathematics, the Phoenicians developed commercial arithmetic, necessitated by their enormous commerce. According to Strabo, the Syrians applied themselves especially to the science of numbers, navigation and astronomy. They were in fact the first to notice the connection of the moon with the tides and make a practical application of astronomy to navigation. It is also said that the Phoenicians regularly supplied the weights and measures used by their neighbours, the Chaldeans. In all respects, therefore, their culture was a natural consequence of the commercial spirit engendered by the sea. With the rise of Grecian culture, a new topographical principle entered to alter the trend of development. Numerous mountain walls fence off the Grecian peninsula into a large number of isolated districts, each of which became the seat of a separate community or state, which never coalesced into a single nation. Moreover, the coast is indented with numerous deep inlets, forming excellent harbours and giving every inducement to commerce. So numerous and deep are these inlets that the country is practically an archipelago, no place in Greece being 40 miles from the sea. To this combination of mountain and coastal elements was largely due the versatility of the Greeks, 
while the exhilarating atmosphere and brilliant skies of Attica were also intimately related to their intellectual vigour and attainments. The same principle of diversity is also met in the origin of the Greeks. There was here no such inbreeding of native stock as characterised Egypt and China, but at the outset a mixture of races, partly autochthonous and partially foreign, from which there evolved a higher type of intellect than had yet appeared. The diverse sources of their civilization was acknowledged by the Greeks in their mythology. Thus the induction of agriculture was ascribed to Triptolemus, fire was introduced by Prometheus from the Caucasus. Aeschylus speaks of iron as Scythian, while Poseidon introduced the olive, the horse, and the arts of spinning and weaving. The foundation of the various states was also ascribed to foreigners. Thus Athens was said to owe its origin to Cecrops, the Egyptian, the Peloponnesus derived its name from Pelops, of Phrygia, Argos was settled by Danaeus of Egypt, and Thebes by Cadmus of Phoenicia. Even their religion was borrowed from more ancient nations. For example, the twelve labours of Hercules rests upon the ancient idea of the sun performing its cycle through the twelve signs of the zodiac. With the general shifting of the tribes which succeeded the Trojan War, the Dorians and Ionians came to be the dominant races of Greece. The Dorian band, which invaded Lacedaemon, called also Sparta from its grain fields, was at first forced by the scantiness of its numbers to be constantly on the defensive, which developed in then the warlike and hardy spirit which finally made the Spartans dominant in the Peloponnesus. The Ionians inhabited Attica, where the contending geographic factors of plain, coast and mountain transformed their original monarchy into a democracy and a little fortress upon a rock into the mighty Acropolis of Athens. For centuries the synonym of learning and democracy. The Athenians, said Herodotus, then grew mighty, and it became plain that liberty is a brave thing. No phase of Greek culture was more expressive of their national characteristics than their mathematical attainments. Heterogeneity, which formed the basal elements of their national character, was here apparent in the diverse sources from which their mathematics was derived. Thales, the first great Greek mathematician and the founder of the Ionian school, was a native of Miletus, who spent much of his life in Egypt as a merchant, where he studied geometry and astronomy. Pythagoras, who was a contemporary of Thales and founder of the Pythagorean school, was of Phoenician origin, and in his early life studied for several years in Egypt and travelled extensively in Asia Minor. The Ionian and Pythagorean schools were jointly the founders of Greek mathematics, which took the form of an abstract deductive geometry, as distinguished from the practical empirical geometry of the Egyptians. It was in fact the boast of the Pythagoreans that they sought knowledge and not power, and had raised mathematics above the needs of merchants. One of their maxims was, a figure and a step forward, not a figure to gain three or bully. The principles of Pythagoras were required to pass through a preliminary training consisting in a moral and religious preparation for life, which included the elements of music and mathematics. In fact, Pythagoras made the science of numbers the basis of his philosophy in the belief that accurate measurement was essential to the definition of form, and consequently that the entire universe was founded upon a numerical basis. Thus, among other attributes of number, the cause of colour was a number five. The origin of fire was to be found in the pyramid. The four elements, earth, air, fire and water, were represented by the tetrad. Eight was a symbol of death, because the sum of the figures in the successive multiples of eight decreased successively by one. Nine was a symbol of immortality, since the sum of the figures in the multiples of nine remained constants. Plato, the great philosopher of the later Athenian school, also regarded mathematics as the basis of his philosophy, placing over his door the famous inscription, Let none ignorant of geometry enter here. It is also noteworthy that, when he was questioned as to the occupation of the deity, Plato replied, He geometrizes continually. This lofty idealism was characteristic of Greece, and entirely foreign to the prosaic civilizations of Egypt and Assyria. Only the combination of sea, mountain and climate found in Hellas could produce the unique type of the Grecian genius. This dependence of type on surroundings is evidenced by the fixity of type apparent in ancient races. Thus the Fellahines still bear the imprint of the pharaohs on their countenances and draw water with the shadouf, as at the dawn of history, while the Chinaman is still found reckoning with the beaded swan pan, invented twenty-six centuries before Christ. Passing from Greece to Italy, as the next stage in the evolution of culture, 
another great change is manifest. Italy presents no such natural unity as offered by the valley of the Nile and the Tigre Euphrates basin, nor does it present the diversity of Greece, a narrow peninsula bounded by the sea on three sides and lofty mountains on the fourth. The physical peculiarities of Italy naturally cemented the diverse tribes with which it was originally peopled into a single state. The origin of the imperial city dated from a predatory band of Latin shepherds who received into their community the outcasts of the neighbouring tribes, so that even at the outset the dominant idea was that of physical force, a principle which pervades the whole fabric of Roman civilization. The rape of the Sabine women confirms the tradition that the band, being without women, was a predatory union of outcasts, or what Livy calls a culovis. The growth of the Roman state was throughout a process of accretion, rather than the unfolding of a vital principle. The civilization of the Romans was likewise due to this policy of absorption, borrowing their religion and culture from surrounding nations. But while the gods of the Greeks and the Egyptians found a home on the banks of the Tiber, they were there worshipped in a spirit entirely foreign to that of their nativity. For whereas the Greeks worshipped their divinities from an innate love of abstract beauty, the Romans worshipped the same gods from a spirit of necessity, bargaining with them for physical protection and material success. Again, although the Romans borrowed the Grecian games, they had no idea of the aesthetic pleasure derived by the Greeks from perfect physical development, but degraded them into mere gladiatorial combats or exhibitions of brute force in which they were spectators and not participants. Science and art were neglected, and in literature they were largely indebted to the Greeks. Only in building and public works did the practical spirit of the Romans assert itself with any originality. Even here, outside assistance was relied upon to furnish the necessity of technical skill. The order issued by Augustus Caesar that all the world should be taxed being based on a survey of Egyptian surveyors. The 5th century AD was known as the Era of the Great Migration. Owing, it is supposed, to climatic changes, the Teutonic tribes inhabiting the great central plain of Europe were forced outward and poured east and south into the Roman Empire. So great was the disturbance occasioned by this outbreak that nearly two centuries elapsed before the turbulence subsided sufficiently to note the changes that had taken place. Meanwhile, an invasion from the east threatened for a time to give the Asiatic caste to civilization. With the fanaticism bred by the inaccessible deserts of the Arabian Peninsula, the Saracens in the 7th century swept westward until they reached southern France, where the tide was finally turned by Charles Martel on the field of Tours. No less astonishing than their conquests was the facility with which the Arabs assimilated the culture and learning of the nations whom they subjugated. Their capital, Baghdad, situated on the Euphrates midway between Greece and India, soon became by reason of its location the meeting place for the scientific thought of these nations, whence it was transmitted by their conquest to Western Europe. The mathematical attainment of the Arabs was, however, distinct from those of either Greece or India, its trend being determined by their religious observances. Thus, the extent of the Muslim dominions coupled with the requirement that a believer should face toward Mecca during prayer made a determination of direction necessary. Also, the performance of prayers and ablations at definite hours of the day and night required an accurate determination of time, while the motion of the moon had to be observed in order to fix the dates of their feasts. From these and similar reasons, the Arabs became active in astronomical research, and in consequence developed the auxiliary science of trigonometry. The turmoil attended upon the invasion of the ancient world by the Teutons and Saracens so obscured the progress of civilization at this period, although in reality one of beginnings is known in history as the Dark Ages. The most important feature of this vast influence of barbarians so called was a rapid conversion of the Teutons to Christianity. A colder climate had bred in them a more vigorous mentality and a higher type of morality than that of the South and Christianity appeared with a special force to their innate love of freedom and spirit of brotherhood. History thus had been recorded of the physical evolution of humanity. Egypt, China, Chaldea, Assyria and Babylonia typified the childhood of the race with its characteristic dependence upon nature, apparent even in its culture. Greece with its love of form, self-consciousness and passion for freedom represented the adolescent stage, while physical development culminated in the forceful and prosaic Roman spirit typical of manhood. The birth at this time of the child in Bentham in Judea 
was then not a casual event but a necessity the first adam had been made a living soul and in slow process of time had attained his majority the second adam was made a quickening spirit creating a new form of energy which thenceforward was destined to transform religion philosophy art music science language and sociology well may the germans call it its founder der Enzieg. the connecting link between ancient and modern civilization during this transition period was found in the church early in its history the church had developed the institution of monasticism in the attempt to check the flagrant social evils of the east and preserve the purity of the northern races the institution so established soon spread over all europe one order alone the benedictines having at one time over forty thousand monasteries the spirit of brotherhood thus manifested by the church was also apparent in the state in the development of feudalism for slavery and more especially in the principle of chivalry the church however had a more direct influence upon culture by reason of the schools that sprang up in the shelter of the monasteries and that it developed into the early medieval universities all learning and particularly mathematics was confined to these conventional schools and comprised practically nothing more than was essential to the church learning was divided into the trivium and quadrivium the trivium consisting of grammar logic and rhetoric or in short the mastery of the latin language in which the services of the church were conducted and the quadrivium consisting of arithmetic music geometry and astronomy the latter were also limited to the needs of the church comprising arithmetic or for keeping accounts music for use in church services geometry for surveying the extensive property of the church and astronomy for the calculation of easter these constituted the seven liberal arts as enumerated in the line lingua tropus ratio numerus tonus angulus astra and marked limit of attainment or as expressed in the verse of the eleventh century quia tria quia septum quia totum scobel novit the most significant effect produced by the church upon culture however arose in a manner unintentional and unforeseen the rapid growth of papal authority had led the church to undertake violent measures for its own aggrandizement chief of which was the crusades the activity incident of these great movements made florence and venice renowned for their wealth while it also gave the hansenic league command of the trade of the north with the growth of prosperity came increased leisure for intellectual development resulting in the italian renaissance and the european revival of learning the crusades also influenced development still more directly by opening lines of communication with the east whereby the learning that had laid dormant in the byzantine empire became current in europe toward the close of the fifteenth century the discovery of america closely followed by the circumnavigation of the world gave dominance once more to the influence of the sea the effect of such a strong suggestion of boundless and unknown possibilities intensified by the element of hazard and daring became at once an important factor in development stimulating ambition creating moral fibre and inspiring a passion for freedom with the opening of the sixteenth century the narrow and vague ideas characteristic of scholasticism began to give place to clear and strong thinking as the church had been the centre and source of medieval authority the struggle for freedom naturally centred around this institution beginning with the reform of certain abuses the spirit of the reformation ended by repudiating the entire authority of the church epitomized by the action of luther in nailing his ninety-five theses to the door of the church in wittenberg thus undermining the whole system of tradition and inaugurating a new principle of action based on individuality the relation of this moral attitude to the development of culture was nowhere more evident than in the trend taken by mathematics everywhere old methods were questioned and new ones substituted the first great advance naturally occurred in germany and italy in the former the time-honoured system of ptolemaic astronomy gave place to the copernican theory and notable advances were also made in other branches of mathematics especially algebra and trigonometry the intervention of the thirty years war followed by the prussian war stayed german development for a time but with the return of peace the german spirit again manifested itself in the critical attitude towards science and religion which found expression in mathematics in the function theory and in philosophy and religion in agnosticism in france where the invigorating effects of climate and race were less marked 
the 16th century was characterized by such acts of religious intolerance as the massacres of Fassi and St. Bartholomew, leaving no energy for scientific pursuits. The ascension of Henry IV to the throne, however, followed by the Edict of Nantes, which terminated the religious strife, produced an immediate effect. The age of Richelieu became remarked for scientific and cultural progress. Great literature also produced and in mathematics the period was more illustrious by the names of Roberval, Descortes, Desargues, Fermat, and Pascal, who in brief founded modern analytic and projective geometry, and laid the foundations for the calculus. The latitude of England made it later in development than either France or Germany, while its insular position also introduced an important modification. Extensive commercial relations were developed, which, as in the case of the Phoenicians, force arithmetic into prominence. The first advance consisted of substituting for the old Bohemian arithmetic, inherited from the Romans, the more powerful algorithm of the Arabs, introduced by way of the trade roads between England and Italy. In the hands of the English, however, arithmetic was soon transformed into the practical art demanded by their commerce and characteristic of their genius. The most notable addition being the invention of logarithms. So rapidly was this transformation effected that within the decade after the invention of logarithms, they had come into general use. With the growing mastery of man over nature, the effect of environment in modifying history became somewhat less apparent. Sufficient has been said, however, to suggest the dynamic influence of geography upon culture and indicate the new light thrown upon intellectual development when studied from the standpoint of physiography. End of The Geographical Aspect of Culture by Stephen Elmer Slocum, PhD Recorded by Leon Harvey A History of Syphilis by Ivan Bloch from Volume 1 of A System of Syphilis edited by Darcy Power and J. Keogh Murphy, 1908 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A quarter of a century has elapsed since the vexed question of the origin of syphilis was first critically discussed by Montejo y Robledo, a Spanish army surgeon at the fourth meeting of the International American Congress, held at Madrid in 1882. Dr. Montejo had occupied himself for a long time in investigating the origin of syphilis, and he communicated the results at which he had arrived to the International American Congress, because he recognized that the recent origin of this disease was especially connected with America. The information gathered by Montejo was gained almost exclusively from Spanish sources. He made an exhaustive collection of his authorities, collated them carefully, and examined them critically. But his work might have remained in obscurity if attention had not been drawn to it by Professor Seller in 1895, who had arrived at substantially the same conclusions about the appearance of syphilis in Europe as had already been deduced by Dr. Montejo. Professor Bins of Bonn, ignorant of Montejo's work, published a paper on the occasion of the quatrocentenary of Columbus, in which he advocated the long discredited view that syphilis in the old world was a disease of comparatively modern origin which could be traced to America. The admirable work of Montejo, Seller and Bins deals with only one side of the question as to the origin of syphilis, their results being based mainly upon Spanish records. But the whole question to be answered is whether syphilis is a disease of modern origin or if it has always existed. Because if the modern origin is accepted and the antiquity of the disease be denied, the problem of its origin and the introduction is solved at one and the same time. However much the interest of Americans may be bound up in the positive statesmen of Dr. Montejo, and whatever the amount of weight which should be attached to them, further consideration is necessary, 
as it is impossible to bring forward these alone as a complete and definite answer to the question. I have endeavoured in my work on the origin of syphilis to discover the other links in the problem and to demonstrate their connection with each other, and I would refer the reader to that work for more detailed information and for documentary evidence which can only be indicated briefly in the present article. There are two chief reasons which have made it impossible to dispel entirely the obscurity which surrounds the origin and the first appearance of syphilis in the old world, in spite of the endeavours of such men as Astruc, Girtaner and Hensler in the 18th century. The first reason is that historical criticism had not advanced sufficiently to mask the stupendous mistakes and misstatements which had arisen in the course of centuries about a disease so widely extended and so much talked about as syphilis. In the second place, it was only in the latter part of the 19th century that the progress of medical science made it possible to obtain an accurate knowledge of the different forms of venereal disease. The history of these diseases and the statements concerning them appear, therefore, in a very different light to us from that in which they presented themselves to our predecessors. Thanks to improvements in historical criticism and to advances in the science of pathology, I believe that it is now possible to give a definite and positive answer to the question of the recent origin of syphilis in the old world. All available statements and facts point to the last decade of the 15th century, particularly the years 1493 to 1500, as the time when syphilis first appeared in the old world. There is not a particle of evidence to show that the disease existed in Europe before that time. This is not the place to enumerate all the theories, hypotheses, superstitions and fantastic conceptions which have been associated with the sudden appearance of this terrible disease, God, man and beast have been successively saddled with the responsibility for the scourge, and even the planets have been looked upon as the ultimate originators of syphilis, in accordance with the astrological superstition current in the science of the age, when the disease first attracted attention. Every form of incontinence, too, has been looked upon as the cause of the disease, in utter forgetfulness that unchastity was no new vice and that it had long existed without giving rise to syphilis. Worse than these absurd fancies were those errors and half-conscious deceptions upon which was founded the belief that syphilis had existed in antiquity and during the earlier part of the Middle Ages a belief which gradually assumed so dogmatic a form that it was subscribed to by such eminent medical historians as Heinrich Hesser and August Hirsch. It is now easy to expose the errors which led to the belief in the antiquity of syphilis in the old world, and thus to demonstrate the futility of such a view. Conscious deceptions must be considered first, and afterwards, that lack of definition which caused many different diseases to be classified together under a single general heading. It has been said already that the first reliable information about syphilis dates its appearance to the year 1493, but certain contradictory statements appear in literature concerning its existence in earlier times. The most notable of these are the two communications of Franz Josef Boltmann and Petrus Martyr, which considerably furthered the belief in the antiquity of syphilis. Boltmann, in his Antiquities of the Rheingau, Rheingau de Altertümer, which appeared in 1819, reproduced a passage from the chapter records of St. Victor in Mainz, which deals with a chorister who suffered from Dimada Franzos. These chapter records date presumably from the year 1472. According to my investigations, which have been confirmed by Professor Karl von Hegel, this date, 
1472, which has so long fascinated historians, was falsified by Botman and was not originally contained in the document which belongs to a much later epoch. It is known, indeed, that nearly the entire life-work of this strange man consists of forgeries in the most widely differing departments of science. Within the last few months, Dr. Herbert Meyer, lawyer and private docent of Breslau, has communicated the astonishing information that the so-called provincial law of the Rheingau, Rheingauer Landrecht, has in reality never had any existence, but is one of the cleverest forgeries of this particular bald man, which for a century has duped lawyers and legal historians, just as the falsified date, 1472, has duped medical men. For in this year, Botman asserted that syphilis was already known in mines. In the same category with Botman's forgery may be placed the celebrated letter which Pedro's martyr is said to have dispatched to his friend Pedro Arias Barbosa, a professor of Greek at Salamanca, and in which mention is already made of Morbus Gallicus. This letter, unlike Botman's forgery, was looked upon with mistrust even by earlier investigators, for Pedro's martyr describes as a layman as early as the year 1489 symptoms of syphilis and gives it the name with which the rest of the world only became familiar six years later. The more recent critical investigators into the Opus Epistolarum of Pedro's Martyr, from Leopold von Branke to Jacob Bernays, have established the fact that the dating of the letters is purely arbitrary, that they are for the most part fictitious, and that, in particular, the letter to Barbosa could not have been written before 1508, since in this year a chair of Greek was first founded in Salamanca. The second source of error was the lack of definition which for centuries prevailed in the conception of venereal contagion. Up to the time of record, i.e. at the beginning of the second half of the 19th century, the three venereal affections, syphilis, venereal ulcer and gonorrhea, were not clearly differentiated, but were thought to be fundamentally the same. Whereas we now know that syphilis in particular, as a specific infectious disease with constitutional symptoms, has to be sharply distinguished from the other venereal disorders, which only locally manifest themselves. This early belief in the identity of all venereal affections was substantiated long afterwards, even by such an authority as John Hunter, who based his conclusions on experiments wrongly interpreted. This led to the historical side of the subject being treated from the same point of view. If gonorrhea and soft chancre were syphilitic in origin, then syphilis had naturally always been in existence. Certain descriptions of and references to diseases of the genital organs by ancient and medieval authors could easily be taken as indicating syphilis, but a gradual recognition of the completely different natures of the three venereal affections showed these indications to be untenable. Their utter worthlessness can be realized in the light of modern dermatological development, which has made us familiar with a wholly new group of diseases, viz. the pseudo-venereal and pseudo-syphilitic. These are skin diseases, which in part imitate with deceptive similarity the syphilitic syndrome. I refer only to those peculiar infective complaints which, like syphilis, manifest themselves at the same time upon the body, the genitals, and in the oral cavity, such as certain forms of pemphigus, impetigo, herpes, and erythema exudativum multiforme. Other chronic skin diseases, too, can simulate syphilis in respect of localization and appearance. To these belong, for instance, lichen rubber, which is not uncommonly present on the buccal mucous membrane and genitals, as well as upon the rest of the body, psoriasis with the same distribution, etc. This group of pseudo-venereal and pseudo-syphilitic diseases is exceptionally large, and even 60 years ago the clinical physician can start, 
realized that it furnished all the repute cases of syphilis described by the older authors. It may be remarked in this conjunction that nowhere is any indication found that a causal connection was recognized between disease of the genitals and the skin affection of the rest of the body and oral cavity before the date I have given. The fact that in the entire literature of the Old World, both Occidental and Oriental, no description of the syphilitic syndrome anterior to the year 1495 is to be met with, whilst only from this date onwards does it rank as an independent disease, is happily substantiated by the results of the disinternment of bones. Since the bones are the only portions of the human body which withstand under favorable conditions the ravages of time and maintain their original form after death, these dumb but necessarily infallible witnesses were appealed to for proof of the existence in the old world of syphilis, both in prehistoric and in historic times up to 1493. One single skeleton found in the whole range of the Old World, which could be referred indubitably to a period prior to 1493, and which bore undoubted traces of syphilitic disease, would at once put an end to the whole discussion upon the age and origin of this complaint. According to the adherents of the theory of the ancient origin of syphilis, it was to be expected that not merely a few but very many bones showing syphilitic changes would have been found in the old world. What a mass of such evidence must the unbridled licentiousness of imperial Rome and the excesses of the Middle Ages have provided, since, according to the opinion of these investigators, the nature of the then existing syphilis was not recognized nor moreover was it rationally treated. It is to be expected, too, that the spherous forms of bone disease in the nose and palate would be seized on and described by the exponents of this theory. In reality, despite the most painstaking research from amongst the unnumbered thousands of remains of human skeletons of prehistoric, antique or medieval origin, it has not been possible to discover a single bone showing undoubted signs of syphilitic changes. Birchow has repeatedly declared that no such pre-Columbian or prehistoric bone was known to him, and it is quite certain that no such bone is contained in either English or German collections or museums. I had the opportunity of searching the ample Hunterian collection in London with reference to this point. It contains, amongst other things, numerous skeletal remains from medieval graves, showing different pathological changes, but not a single bone was syphilitic lesions is amongst them. The same holds true of the collection in the Natural History and Anatomical Museums in Cambridge. These statements of French investigators, notably of Perrault and Zambaco, upon the presence of syphilitic changes in prehistoric bones, have not been verified by competent later investigators, nor by those who are familiar with syphilitic bone lesions, such as Virchow, Fournier and Bayet. Perrault mistook rachitic for syphilitic changes, and Zambaco's case was a typical one of arthritis deformance. It is, however, desirable that a thorough examination should be made of the morbid skeletons in the Paris museums. So far, Bischoff's statement holds good that no single undoubtedly syphilitic bone has yet been found within the confines of the old world, which dates from before the discovery of America. And yet, says the same authority, we frequently see bones from the uncivilized races in the most widely separated parts of the world, which prove most conclusively that syphilis spread amongst them after contact with the Europeans. I need only call attention to bones from the Philippines, from New Caledonia and from Australia. If we inquire when this first contact occurred, 
we are met with the surprising fact that it only dates from after the discovery of America, and in particular from after the outbreak of the great epidemic of syphilis at the end of the 15th century. This sudden outbreak of syphilis at the beginning of the last decade of the 15th century is the first undoubted fact, the starting point from which investigation into the origin of syphilis can begin. The campaign of Charles VIII of France during the year 1494 to 1495, as a result of which many mercenary bands of considerable strength, accompanied by a great following of women, collected in Italy, and there got into touch with one another, furnished the most favourable opportunity for the spread of such a disease as syphilis. There can no longer be any doubt that syphilis first attracted attention in Europe when the French under Charles VIII sojourned in Italy. The date thus determined for the first appearance of syphilis in epidemic form is that unanimously agreed upon by the contemporary chronicles and medical authors of the most widely separated countries. The greater number of contemporaries report that this occurrence took place during the stay of the French army in Naples and therefore between February and May 1495. Critical examination of reports of the period shows their unanimity in this, that they consider an invasion from without as having certainly occurred, and that they lay the blame upon the Spaniards. The Italian town chronicles enable one distinctly to follow the triumphal march of syphilis from town to town throughout Italy. Everywhere the well-known dates 1495 and 1496 are given. By June 1495, syphilis had already penetrated to the northernmost part of the Apennine Peninsula to the borders of France, Switzerland and Germany. The information as to the first appearance of this venereal disease is of the greatest weight, since it comes entirely from contemporaries who lived in contact with the sudden eruption of the complaint, and who must, in part, have borne traces of it upon their own bodies. Laymen and physicians are at one in asserting that the disease had previously been unknown in Italy, or, moreover, took it for granted that it had been introduced from abroad. Its sudden mysterious appearance and its unknown nature caused the disease to make a profound impression everywhere and to strike all men with horror. This horror sprang, not so much from the complete ignorance concerning the new disease, as from the fear which its severity and virulence spread abroad. The contemporary writers of every nation always paint the disease in the darkest colours. This malignity of syphilis can only be explained, according to our modern views as to the nature and manifestations of the disorder, on the supposition that all those races that have been attacked with corresponding severity had hitherto been completely syphilis-free. How otherwise can the severe phenomena observed at that time be explained, together with the early occurrence of the so-called secondary symptoms, often even after a few days, the high fever and the intensity of the pain, particularly the unbearable arthralgia, the severe secondary skin affections, the so-called syphilitic smallpox, the frequently occurred bodily decline, and finally the undoubted frequency of a fatal ending? How could a reputedly ancient plague of mankind attack so many nations with such exaggerated intensity? Again, it was not the case of a pestilence limited to a definite area for which special causes could be held responsible. The fact is that the outbreak of syphilis, which occurred at the end of the 15th century, involved all the European races and nations in the same degree and with the same virulence. Even today we see, wherever syphilis is introduced into a virgin country, the same acute course, the same intensity of its manifestations as in its first appearance in Europe. The connection of the above facts and events is obvious, and it leads us at once to the questions 
what is the explanation of the sudden appearance of syphilis in Italy? By what path did the skirt travel thither? These questions include those of the real origin and of the most ancient home of syphilis. The answer to these has already been given by contemporaries. Two main sources have to be considered in this connection. Firstly, the reports of Spanish authors, to whom, as already mentioned, Montejo, Seller and Bins have recently redirected attention. Secondly, the communications of Italian chroniclers. Each source supplements the other so that they eventually settle the whole question. Amongst the most important of the authentic reports of the Spanish authors are those of Díaz de Isla, Oviedo, Las Casas, Roman Payne and Hernández. But the most important witness in favor of the recent origin of syphilis is Rui Díaz de Isla, 1462-1542. At the time of the first appearance of syphilis in Europe, he had already passed his 30th year, was a physician, indeed a physician of note, and last and most important fact of all, was himself a witness of the invasion of syphilis, which he observed to a certain extent upon its landing in Europe. We know that Diaz de Isla was in practice in 1493 in Barcelona, later in Seville, and for ten years held the position of surgeon to the Hospital of All Saints in Lisbon. Here he acquired a large experience in syphilis, which he incorporated in a special work, the oldest edition of which, published between 1510 and 1520, was discovered by Montejo in the National Library of Madrid. The title of this work runs Tratado llamado Fruto de todos los santos contra el mal de la isla española hecho por Maestre Rodrigo de Isla, cirujano vecino de Lisboa, para común e general provecho de los pacientes enfermos de la semejante enfermedad que vulgarmente llamado bubas. I.e. Treatise entitled Fruit of All Saints Against the Disease of the Island Española by Master Rodrigo de Isla, surgeon and citizen of Lisbon, to the common and general good of those suffering from the disease in question, commonly called bubas. In the first chapter, the origin and introduction of syphilis is exhaustively described. This report contains facts of the author's own experience and own observation, and with one blow rents the veil which has covered the origin of syphilis. The contents are briefly as follows. Syphilis was unknown in Europe before the year 1493. Its home is America, or as far as Europe is concerned, the island of Española or Haiti, whence the crew of Columbus brought it after the latter's first voyage. Hence, syphilis is called by Diaz de Isla, disease of the island of Española. By the Indians of Haiti, however, the disease is known as Guainaras, or also Hippas, Taibas and Igas. The majority of Columbus's crew became infected there with syphilis and returned sick to Spain. Diaz de Isla himself treated several syphilitic sailors from this squadron in Barcelona, and mentions, amongst others, the pilot Pinzon de Palos as one of those smitten with the new scourge. The complaint was quite unknown to the sailors themselves. After the arrival in Barcelona of Columbus in the year 1493, syphilis spread there amongst the inhabitants, while as yet Ferdinand the Catholic and Isabella were present. In the following year, 1494, Charles VIII of France began preparations for a great campaign and attracted mercenaries from neighboring countries. Amongst these were many Spaniards infected with syphilis. Thus, it came about that syphilis spread during the stay of the French army in Italy, and finally, through the combination of so many circumstances favorable to an epidemic outbreak, achieved that sudden and terrible diffusion of which we have learned. Syphilis had been known in Espanola from time immemorial. 
At the time of Columbus's arrival, the Indians were already in possession of a highly complicated, rationally developed and deducted method of cure of this ailment, the details of which Diaz de Isla learned in the year 1504 from a translation. This consisted chiefly in treatment by means of guayacum and other vegetable beverages, in conjunction with hydrotherapeutic, dietetic and climatic methods of treatment. This classical record of Diaz de Isla is fully borne out by the communications of Oviedo and Las Casas. Oviedo, a distinguished courtier and one of those scholars frequently met with at the time, who even in early youth had acquired a many-sided culture, also found himself in Barcelona at the time of the return of Columbus in the year 1493. He struck a friendship with the son of the discoverer and acquired much useful information concerning the new world from Columbus himself and from the brothers Pinzon. Later he was for some time in Italy, shortly after the campaign of Charles VIII, and moreover spent several periods of a year each in the new world in Haiti and Central America. His communications upon syphilis are chiefly to be found in the 13th chapter of the second book of his great Historia General y Natural de las Indias, and further in an interesting report which he drew up at the command of the Emperor Charles V, and which is printed in Barcia's well-known collection. These reports show the complete accord of Oviedo with Díaz de Isla in relation to the American origin of syphilis. Oviedo declares it to be a specific disease of the Antilles and Central American continent. According to him, syphilis was communicated to the first Spaniards who came there with Columbus by the Indian women and brought by them to Spain, whence it soon spread abroad upon the occasion of the campaign of Charles VIII. The name of the disorder should be West Indian disease rather than French or Neapolitan disease. Amongst his informants, whom he questioned immediately after their return, Oviedo includes both those who accompanied Columbus upon his first journey and those who were with him on his second. Amongst the first, he mentions in particular the pilot Vicente Yañez Pinzon, one of the three brothers Pinzon. This is a remarkable and exceptionally valuable confirmation of the statement of Diaz de Isla, for the latter also mentions a Pinzon, whom he saw with the first fleet of Columbus in Barcelona, to whom he spoke, and who, like many other participants of the first voyage, brought back syphilis from the New World. It is highly probable that this Pinzon is identical with the one mentioned by Oviedo. The preface to the report by Oviedo to the Emperor Charles V is noteworthy. He says there with emphasis, Your Majesty may take it as certain that this disease has originated in the West Indies and is common amongst the Indians, but in those regions is not so dangerous as with us. Oviedo, in his large work upon the West Indies, has, as is recognized, attempted, in the interests of the Spanish conquerors, to justify their terrible treatment of the natives, For this purpose, some historians suggest that he invented the fable of the American origin of syphilis. The weakness of this argument is demonstrated by the obvious fact that the noble Las Casas, the opponent of Oviedo and the friend of the Indians, also testifies to the American origin of the disorder. He, too, was contemporary with the introduction of syphilis, his father even accompanying Columbus on his second journey, was he himself, as early as 1498, at the age of 24, went to Haiti, where, after many voyages in Central and South America, he took a permanent residence and wrote his famous Historia General de las Indias. In Volume 5, Chapter 19 of this work, he says of Haiti, There were, and still are, two things which at the beginning were very dangerous to the Spaniards. One is the disease syphilis, which in Italy is known as the French evil. 
It is, however, known for certain that it came from this island, either when, with the return of the Admiral Don Cristobal Colón, with the news of the discovery of the West Indies, the first Indians arrived, whom I saw myself in Seville, or it may be that certain Spaniards were already tainted with this disease at the time of the first return to Castile. And, as at that period, King Charles of France went with a great army to Italy to invade Naples, and this contagious disorder spread throughout the forces, the Italians believed that they had acquired the disease from these soldiers, and therefore gave it the name of French disease. I took the trouble upon several occasions to interrogate the Indians of this island as to whether this disease was of great antiquity, and they answered yes, that it dated from a period long before the advent of the Christians, the origin of it being beyond the memory of any man, and nobody can disbelieve this. It is also an undoubted fact that all Spaniards addicted to sexual excess, who did not in this island observe the virtue of continence, were attacked by the disease, not one in a hundred escaping unless the woman was healthy. La Casas also draws attention to the severity of the symptoms of the disease in the Spaniards compared with its mild course in the natives. We see, therefore, that the reports of three contemporaries, widely sundered in their spheres of life and opposed in their political views, unanimously proclaim the fact that syphilis is of American origin. And it was the syphilis in Haiti which was the unhappy source from which the poison was shortly to stream throughout Europe and the old world. In relation to syphilis in Haiti, there is an interesting record of the Hieronymist father Roman Payne, which has survived and is printed in the Historia del Almirante de las Indias Don Cristóbal Colón. It deals with the syphilis of the Haitian national hero, Quagajona, and describes the Indian sweating cure, which is carried out in a remote place. This locality set apart for the treatment of syphilis is called by Roman Payne Guanara. This is the same word as that mentioned by Diaz de Isla as the designation of syphilis and of things connected with it. This agreement is a conclusive proof of the value of the two documents, since each author makes his record independently of the other. The pre-Columbian existence of syphilis in the Antilles makes its presence on the adjacent mainland of Central America ipso facto probable. The researches of Montejo and Seller have made us familiar with the communications of the Franciscan father Bernardino de Sahagún and the physician Francisco Hernández upon the existence of syphilis in Mexico. Sahagún's record in his Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España are founded upon the communications taken down by himself verbatim from the natives, and that in the Aztec language, since he always laid the greatest stress upon the confirmation of truth. Two passages come specially under consideration. One is found in Book 10, Chapter 28, where syphilis is mentioned under the designation Nanabatol, two varieties of this being distinguished. Placasol nanavatol and tecpil or poco nanavatol, which the short translates as syphilis with large and small pustules. According to this, the ancient Mexicans had already correctly distinguished the severe form of large pustular syphilis from the less malignant variety with small pustules. In the same place, Agun makes interesting statements concerning the Aztec therapeutics of syphilis. It was mainly treated by them with certain internal remedies compounded of vegetable drugs. Still more important is the second chapter of the seventh book of Sagun's works. Here, syphilis plays a part in the Mexican myths, which undoubtedly have come down from ancient Ethan times. Seller rightly remarks that through this fact, the above-quoted passage from Sagun acquires a totally different connotation. This chapter deals with the illumination of the world by sun and moon, and the future sun god is here described as Nanavatsin, i.e. the little syphilitic, 
in Spanish, el bubocito, who has a pustular eruption upon the whole body, and who, in order to be turned into the sun, springs into the fire. The interpretation of this remarkable myth cannot be gone into here. For us, this one fact is of greatest importance, viz. that syphilis is mentioned in pre-Columbian tradition. Nanavatl is syphilis, Nanavatsin is the little syphilitic, and at the same time the name of the god. The main symptom, too, of syphilis as a constitutional disorder, viz. the skin eruption, is distinctly described. According to the researches of Seder, the sun god is looked upon by the Mexicans as the main cause of venereal disease in general, the different varieties of which were well known to them. A welcome addition to this description by Sagun is offered to us in the great work upon natural history of the physician Francisco Hernández, which also is founded on observations made on the spot, and for the greater part on the statements of the Indians themselves. In folio 111 of the Mexican edition of 1615 of his work upon the Mexican vegetable, animal and mineral kingdom, from the aspect of natural history and medicine, he makes mention of the syphilis medicine of the ancient Mexicans, and uses for this a derivative of the same word, nanavatl, which we found recorded by Sagun as the designation of syphilis. The syphilis medicine is called nanavapatli. For further traces of syphilis in Central America, reference must be made to the detailed communications of Montejo and Seller as well as to my large work. Again, this important fact may be added, that throughout America, definite names for syphilitic manifestations are met with, whilst it is recognized that in the old world, upon its first appearance, lack of familiarity with the disease was responsible for the absence of any designation and countless appellations, many of them absurd, were artificially coined. Each nation, too, named syphilis after the nation or country from which it first received the disease. For instance, the Indians and Japanese called it the Portuguese disorder from its introduction by the Portuguese. The Russians called it the Polish disease, the Turks the Frank disease. Montejo and Seller have therefore rightly ascribed a great importance to the definite nomenclature among the American Aboriginal races as bearing upon the antiquity of syphilis in America. Confirmation of the decisive narratives of Diaz de Isla, Oviedo, Las Casas and others concerning the origin of syphilis from America is obtainable from contemporary Spanish and Italian documents and chronicles. Montejo was able to refer to documents in the hospital archives of Seville, bearing out the correctness of the statement of Las Casas that syphilis was introduced into Seville by the crews of Columbus, the most important point settled by him being that locally it was at once called Sarampion de las Indias, i.e. West Indian eruption, a disease emanating from the West Indies. The introduction of the complaint into Barcelona has been directly proved to us by Diaz de Isla and Oviedo. We have, however, a third reliable witness of the propagation of syphilis in Barcelona even before the campaign of Charles VIII, in the person of the Italian humanist Nicolaus Silasius, who, in a letter of June 1495 from Barcelona, gives intelligence of the syphilis epidemic which had existed for a long time in that place, and as a result of which many inhabitants had been affected. This epidemic was stated to have existed for considerably more than a year in Barcelona. Finally, many contemporary Italian chroniclers assure us of the introduction of syphilis from America by way of Spain, Thus, it is stated in the Sicilian Annals, as early as 1498, that syphilis had broken out in Naples, which had been visited by Spaniards, who brought the plague with them from the West Indies. Senarega even states categorically in his History of Genoa 
that syphilis had appeared in Spain two years before the campaign of Charles VIII, i.e. in 1493, where it had been introduced from the far west. The contemporary Italian physicians, Alexander Benedictus and Antonio Benevieni, also declared that syphilis came to Italy from Spain. Many other chroniclers give the same information. The circumstance is also illuminating that Spanish physicians were sent for to Italy for the cure of the disease, as possessing greater experience in the treatment of the new complaint than the Italian practitioners. End of A History of Syphilis by Ivan Bloch, from Volume 1 of A System of Syphilis, edited by Das Bauer and J. K. Murphy, 1908, read by Claudia Calvi. Japan's Ultimatum to Germany by Kato Takaki This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Japan's Ultimatum to Germany, from texts given to the US government and to the international public press, August 16, 1914. We consider it highly important and necessary in the present situation to take measures to remove the causes of all disturbances of the peace in the Far East, and so safeguard the general interests as contemplated by the agreement of alliance between Japan and Great Britain. In order to secure a firm and enduring peace in Eastern Asia, the establishment of which is the aim of the said agreement, the imperial Japanese government sincerely believes it to be its duty to give the advice to the imperial German government to carry out the following two propositions. First, to withdraw immediately from Japanese and Chinese waters German men of war and armed vessels of all kinds, and to disarm at once those which cannot be so withdrawn. Second, to deliver on a date not later than September 15th to the imperial Japanese authorities, without condition or compensation, the entire leased territory of Kichau, with a view to the eventual restoration of the same to China. The imperial Japanese government announces at the same time that in the event of it not receiving by noon on August 23rd, 1914, an answer from the imperial German government, signifying its unconditional acceptance of the above advice offered by the imperial Japanese government, Japan will be compelled to take such action as she may deem necessary to meet the situation. End of Japan's Ultimatum to Germany by Kato Takaki Murdering English by Anonymous from the Columbia Evening Missourian March 5th, 1921 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Murdering English Edward J. Tobin, Superintendent of Schools in Cook County, Illinois, has recently made a ruling that both the teachers and the pupils under his jurisdiction may say he don't and it is me. In other words, Mr. Tobin would say that it is permissible to use a plural verb with a singular subject and the objective case as a predicate noun. With these two new and startling rules, almost any grammatical errors may be excused. Mr. Tobin says that it is I sounds stilted and egotistical, and that, although correct, it is outlawed by common usage and a sense of good form. We know that the expression, it is me, is used by innocent persons and by many who know better, but are lazy and sloven in their speech. But when have we ever modeled our use of the language on the poor speakers and writers? If we desire to follow the example of the illiterate, these two expressions are not even a sample 
of what we might adopt, and one illiterate phrase may be adopted just as easily as another. For the substitution of he don't for he doesn't, Mr. Tobin offers no excuse. Common usage, we suppose, is his reason. He does not even offer the excuse of its sounding stilted. For ourselves, we should have enough pride in our language to want it to remain grammatically correct. And for others, we should not make it any harder to learn English than it already is. Mr. Tobin, by his action, helps to mutilate the language. He makes as his standard of speech the illiterate and goes to the gutter for his study. In the end, Mr. Tobin's English probably will resolve itself into the speech of the small boy who told his dearest enemy, If you uns don't come down and fight we uns, us uns will come up and fight you uns. End of Murdering English Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson The Present Crisis in China from the Standpoint of a Christian Chinese by Rev. G. Gam, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in November 2023 The Present Crisis in China from the Standpoint of a Christian Chinese Rev. G. Gam, California Ever since the Boxer outbreak, I have been repeatedly asked by friends far and near to express my opinion of the matter. I have kept silent for a long time, but still the requests come, and I feel constrained to endeavor to set forth some of the facts which caused the uprising and which resulted in the massacre of so many missionaries and other foreigners and thousands of Chinese Christians. Those who have survived the massacre are destitute and homeless. Our hearts ache with sorrow for the occurrence of those outrages. We know of no words that are adequate to express our horror at them. Every instigator of these cruel wrongs should be severely punished in proportion to the enormity of his crimes, and by this means make them a lasting warning to the people. As to most of the poor, ignorant people who perpetrated the crimes, they are more sinned against than sinning. They are ignorant. They have been deceived by the lies of men who knew they were lying, and who thus sent them into the work of the mob and into battle with the Westerners, to be, thousands of them, slaughtered and tortured, while the real criminals stayed in the rear. To the relatives and friends of those missionaries and other foreigners, Together with the many Christians who were massacred, we extend our heartfelt sympathy, and we cannot but rejoice to say that all these martyrs are happy with their Lord in heaven today. We also rejoice to know that the blood of the martyrs will become the seed of the Church. The Christian Chinese in San Francisco, and many in other cities of the United States, have held meetings every Tuesday evening, from 9.30 to 10.30 o'clock, to pray for China. Moreover, they have given many liberal contributions to relieve the suffering Christians in North China. The Cause of the Trouble The Chinese claimed that they had many good reasons for this uprising. It has often been charged by many non-Christian people in California that the missionaries were to blame for the present outbreak. I think this is unjust. I believe they are truly good men and have the good of China at heart. They have wrought a wonderful work. In fact, whatever China has accomplished is due to the preaching and teaching of these faithful missionaries. It is true that Romish missions have sometimes become political machines. Men have joined the Romish church, and even whole villages have turned their ancestral halls into Romish chapels in order to further their causes in the courts through the influence of French consuls. I can give you many incidents of this character, but one is sufficient. 
Several of the Congregational and Presbyterian Christians in the village of Lang Hao Li, of the Hoi Ping district, not far from Canton, had a piece of land there, and were building a free schoolhouse, which was almost completed, when the enemies of the mission rose and destroyed the building. Worse than this, several of the rioters met and outraged a girl relative of one of the Christians. The girl, because of her disgrace, committed suicide by hanging. The Christians had the perpetrators before the district magistrate who was about to punish them, when suddenly all their relatives, together with the accomplices, about seventy in number, went to Canton and joined the Catholic Church. They then got their priests and the French consul to plead for their imprisoned relatives before the Chinese governor. The result was that every one of the culprits was released and the cases dismissed. These infamous criminals, as soon as they were set at liberty, committed further outrages. They attacked the Christians, drove them from their homes and village, and plundered all their land. All these crimes were committed before the eyes of the Catholic priests. How could they tolerate such detestable acts? It makes our blood boil to see such outrages. We are at a loss to understand why the Catholic priests admitted such people to their churches, and why the French consul so blindly used his influence to liberate such criminals. These things have not only occurred repeatedly in the Kuangtang province of South China, but also throughout the whole empire. The Catholic people have not only wronged the Christians, but also the non-Christians, and thus a strong sentiment is created against them. Whenever there is a chance to pay back, these people will inflict a heavy blow. In fact, these Catholics have already suffered the consequences of their wrongdoing. This is why there were so many more Catholics massacred than Protestants in the recent uprising. But why should the people have killed the Christians at all? Well, in a time of anti-foreign uprising, the people are easily misled. The rioter and those anxious to plunder would surely say, the Christians are just the same as the Catholics, so they killed them to effect robbery. It is also true that the missionaries, especially those of Catholic faith, have often been, by ignorant people, charged with decoying children into their missionary compound and then killing them in order to gouge their eyes out and secure their hearts from which to make medicines. And again we have heard silly rumors like these, the foreigners sent their missionaries to China to first win the hearts of the people and then come with armies to take China for their own. All these different rumors have had their origin in Buddhist and Taoist priests who have shown most bitter jealousy toward Christianity and missionaries. While these absurd rumors have done a great deal of mischief by inciting the people in the recent outbreak, they are very insignificant when compared with the bitter feeling aroused by the greedy grabbing of Chinese territory by the different powers. All praise to the United States, for she is the only nation that does not covet Chinese territory. The other powers are all eager and are doing their utmost to have China partitioned, so that they may each seize upon the territory they covet. In fact, Russia has already taken Port Arthur, New Chang, and other important places, and had practically taken in possession the whole of Shen King province and Manchuria, and still they want the Pechili province. Germany had taken Kia Chau and a large strip of valuable land from the Shantung province, and now she wants more, she wants the whole province, and God alone knows what else she is after. Great Britain took Hong Kong and then Wei Hai Wei, and lately grabbed Kowloon, and for some time past her covetous eye had been firmly fixed on the Yangtze Valley. France made seizure of Annam and Tongking several years ago, and since then she is scheming to extend her northern boundary line far into the Kwangse and Yunnan provinces. She is planning soon to grab the beautiful island of Hainan. Japan also has become insatiable. She has already grabbed the island of Formosa, and now she is waiting impatiently to take forcible possession of the Fukin province. And even Italy has become avaricious. She tried to grab San Mon Bay several years ago, but being single-handed, she failed in her attempt. And perhaps she is now using the power of the Allies to accomplish her greedy design. 
when the news of this grabbing reached from one end of the empire to the other does any one wonder that the chinese felt harsh toward the foreigners if any one has any doubt in this regard let him just put himself in a chinaman's place and he will know it at once so i say the greedy grabbing for territory by the different powers is the principal cause for the recent uprising then again there is the spirit of commercialism which has caused great enmity between china and the western nations for instance in the year eighteen forty great britain for greedy gain declared war against china the cause of the war was the destruction of over twenty thousand chests of opium by the mandarins in their effort to prevent its introduction into the empire the opium had previously been brought into china by british merchants the mandarins repeatedly objected to its introduction and made frequent complaints to the british the governor at canton issued a proclamation prohibiting the people using opium and saying that all violators would be beheaded he afterwards found one of his sons a victim to its use so taking him out to a public place he caused him to be beheaded before thousands of spectators the mandarins continued to use every means in their power to keep opium out of china but all to no avail at length in eighteen forty when they destroyed the twenty thousand chests of opium england claimed a just cause for war and from this time on at the cannon's mouth opium has been forced upon china just think opium one of the worst poisons known to mankind opium has been and is the source of great revenue to england but it is the greatest curse to china it has ruined her to the very core and is one of the great causes of the decay of the empire many thousands of handsome vigorous and hopeful young men are brought every day by its use to untimely deaths oh how the good people of china hate opium how the poor fathers and mothers weep for their opium-cursed sons how many wives shed bitter tears day and night how many little children go hungry because their fathers have become opium fiends yeah how many of these little ones were even sold by their opium crazed fathers what sorrow opium has brought to the homes and england has thrived at the expense of the chinese while england has been accumulating her ill-gotten gains opium has devastated the population of china it seems to me that no one but a chinese can understand the misery no wonder a chinese official of high rank made the following ever memorable request to a retiring british minister i am sorry you are going away but as you have to i do wish so much that you would take your opium with you back to england and i dare say that was the greatest slap great britain has ever received christian england i beseech you to visit the homes which your opium has ruined and desolated christian england i beseech you to rise and call a halt in your infamous traffic christian england be quick and make amends for unless you do god will never forgive you there are many ways in which england can redeem the wrong she has done to china first of all she should stop the traffic in opium then she can also redeem herself today by joining the united states and japan to bring about a speedy and peaceful settlement to the trouble in china if these three powers should declare that they would never permit her dismemberment china would certainly be preserved if this good work is accomplished the united states england and japan will be china's greatest friends they will be rewarded with commerce and other special privileges in other words they will receive a thousandfold in return but to grab china by the throat and say to her give us the best you have is barbarous and non-christian for it is contrary to the teaching of christ to take advantage of china's weakness is inhuman china today is like a man who married in the late years of his life and was blessed with a large family of children who were too young to be of any service to him for the last few years he was sickly and weak the house in which he himself and family lived was a fine one and was the only inheritance from his father but his many neighbors who were rich and powerful and able to assist and establish him if they wished were unfortunately a little selfish 
and looked toward his inheritance with longing eyes. Five of the neighbors, with an insatiable desire for gain, and with the forced consent of the owner, took those rooms which each deemed best for his own interest and gain. These neighbors are now devising schemes and pretenses by which they may grab the best remaining portions. To some minds it seems best that this heritage should be thus petitioned, and they claim that it is the only way to develop and improve this possession, thus utterly ignoring the claims and interests of the lawful possessors. And now, friends, China is the inheritance, and the covetous and greedy neighbors are those whom I have mentioned above. How much better it would be for all the great civilized and Christian nations to make a unanimous effort to help preserve, build up, and Christianize China, rather than to tear her to pieces. Of course, I must admit that the Chinese government, that is, the Empress Dowager, is also responsible for the present state of affairs in China. She was deceived by Prince Tuan, the great anti-foreign leader, who represented to her that the boxers possessed the most remarkable power, by the exercise of which they were able to close the mouths of the foreign cannon and also to render themselves bulletproof. They also told her that they were the best fighters, the best protectors of her dynasty, and the best men to drive out the foreigners. But lately we learn that she greatly regrets the step she has taken, and has issued two edicts urging the boxers to disperse to their homes and be law-abiding subjects, that they were to be destroyed if they should oppose the government troops in any way whatever. If this is true, there is great hope for China. We sincerely hope that she will at once abdicate and allow the emperor, Kuang Su, to resume control, for he is just the man that China needs today. Oh, I do wish that the powers would demand his return to the throne. I am certain that the powers can render no better service to China than to make this demand and see to it that it is complied with. If the emperor were again in power, there would be an easy settlement of the present trouble. The outcome of this general shake-up will undoubtedly be the upbuilding of the empire. I am sure that God will overrule this outbreak for the good of China. I sincerely believe that God has a great future for China. He has preserved her for nearly five thousand years, and he will still preserve her to his glory. The land of Sinim is to be won for Christ. The Chinese empire will then have the same footing as other nations, for her subjects have the making of a great people. The Chinese who became Christians in America will also be a great factor in building up China. God's plan is beyond the comprehension of man. He saw that America did not send forth missionaries fast enough, so he brought out the secluded Chinese to this country to be Christianized by the disciples of Christ, so that they may go back as volunteer missionaries and thus hasten the conversion of China. We are sincerely thankful to America for taking the initiative in negotiations toward preserving the integrity of China. Now as a friend and neighbor, let her continue her good work and may the European powers speedily agree to a peaceful settlement of the entire trouble. Then let America and other Christian nations flood China with 10,000 Protestant missionaries, for I am sure that this is one of the best solutions of the Chinese question, and the only way to conquer China for Christ. End of The Present Crisis in China from the Standpoint of a Christian Chinese by Rev. G. Gam, California May 19, 1869 Proclamation Establishing Eight-Hour Workday By Ulysses S. Grant, President of the United States This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas, the Act of Congress, approved June 25, 1868, constituted, on and after that date, eight hours a day's work for all laborers, workmen, 
and mechanics employed by or on behalf of the government of the United States, and repealed all acts and parts of acts inconsistent therewith. Now, therefore, I, Ulysses S. Grant, President of the United States, do hereby direct that from and after this date no reduction shall be made in the wages paid by the government by the day to such laborers, workmen, and mechanics on account of such reduction of the hours of labor. In testimony whereof, I have hereto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, this nineteenth day of May, A.D. 1869, and of the independence of the United States, the ninety-third. U.S. Grant. End of Proclamation Establishing Eight-Hour Workday by Ulysses S. Grant, President of the United States. Read for LibriVox by Dale Grothman. Proclamation 179, granting full pardon and amnesty for the offense of treason against the United States during the late Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. December 25, 1868 by Andrew Johnson, the President of the United States. A Proclamation. Whereas the President of the United States heretofore set forth several proclamations offering amnesty and pardon to persons who had been or were concerned in the late rebellion against the lawful authority of the government of the United States, which proclamations were severally issued on the 8th day of December, 1863, on the 26th day of March, 1864, on the 29th day of May, 1865, on the 7th day of September, 1867, and on the 4th day of July in the present year. And, whereas the authority of the federal government having been re-established in all the states and territories within the jurisdiction of the United States, it is believed that such prudential reservations and exceptions, as at the dates of said several proclamations, were deemed necessary and proper, may now be wisely and justly relinquished, and that a universal amnesty and pardon for participation in said rebellion extended to all who have borne any part therein will tend to secure permanent peace order and prosperity throughout the land and to renew and fully restore confidence and fraternal feelings among the whole people and their respect for and attachment to the national government designed by its patriotic founders for the general good now therefore be it known that i andrew johnson president of the united states by virtue of the power and authority in me vested by the constitution and in the name of the sovereign people of the united states do hereby proclaim and declare unconditionally and without reservation to all and to every person who directly or indirectly participated in the late insurrection or rebellion a full pardon and amnesty for the offense of treason against the united states or of adhering to their enemies during the late civil war with restoration of all rights privileges and immunities under the constitution and the laws which have been made in pursuance thereof in testimony whereof i have signed these presents with my hand and have caused the seal of the united states 
to be here unto affixed done at the city of washington the twenty-fifth day of december a d 1868 and of the independence of the united states of america the ninety-third the end proclamation one seventy nine granting full pardon and amnesty for the offense of treason against the united states during the late civil war by the president andrew johnson property by james madison this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this term in its particular application means that dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in exclusion of every other individual in its larger and juster meaning it embraces everything to which a man may attach a value and have a right, and which leaves to everyone else the like advantage. In the former sense, a man's land or merchandise or money is called his property. In the latter sense, a man has a property in his opinions and the free communication of them. He has a property of peculiar value in his religious opinions and in the profession and practice dictated by them. He has a property very dear to him in the safety and liberty of his person. He has an equal property in the free use of his faculties and free choice of the objects on which to employ them. In a word, as a man is said to have a right to his property, he may be equally said to have a property in his rights. Where an excess of power prevails, property of no sort is duly respected. No man is safe in his opinions, his person, his faculties, or his possessions. Where there is an excess of liberty, the effect is the same, though from an opposite cause. Government is instituted to protect property of every sort, as well that which lies in the various rights of individuals as that which the term particularly expresses. This being the end of government, that alone is a just government, which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own. According to this standard of merit, the praise of affording a just security to property should be sparingly bestowed on a government which, however scrupulously guarding the possessions of individuals, does not protect them in the enjoyment and communication of their opinions, in which they have an equal, and in the estimation of some, a more valuable property. More sparingly should this praise be allowed to a government where a man's religious rights are violated by penalties, or fettered by tests, or taxed by a hierarchy. Conscience is the most sacred of all property. Other property depending in part on positive law, the exercise of that being a natural and unalienable right. To guard a man's house as his castle, to pay public and enforce private debts with the most exact faith, can give no title to invade a man's conscience, which is more sacred than his castle, or to withhold from it that debt of protection for which the public faith is pledged, by the very nature and original conditions of the social pact. That is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where the property which a man has in his personal safety and personal liberty is violated by arbitrary seizures of one class of citizens for the service of the rest. A magistrate issuing his warrants to a press gang would be in his proper functions in Turkey or Indostan under appellations proverbial of the most complete despotism. That is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where arbitrary restrictions, exemptions, and monopolies deny to part of its citizens that free use of their faculties and free choice of their occupations, which not only constitute their property in the general sense of the word, but are the means of acquiring property strictly so called. What must be the spirit of legislation where a manufacturer of linen cloth is forbidden to bury his own child in a linen shroud in order to favor his neighbor who manufactures woolen cloth, where the manufacturer and wearer of woolen cloth are again forbidden the economical use of buttons of that material in favor of the manufacturer of buttons of other materials? 
a just security to property is not afforded by that government under which unequal taxes oppress one species of property and reward another species. Where arbitrary taxes invade the domestic sanctuaries of the rich, and excessive taxes grind the faces of the poor. Where the keenness and competitions of want are deemed an insufficient spur to labor, and taxes are again applied by an unfeeling policy as another spur, in violation of that sacred property which heaven, in decreeing man to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow, kindly reserved to him, in the small repose that could be spared from the supply of his necessities. If there be a government, then, which prides itself in maintaining the inviolability of property, which provides that none shall be taken directly even for public use without indemnification to the owner, and yet directly violates the property which individuals have in their opinions, their religion, their persons, and their faculties, nay more, which indirectly violates their property in their actual possessions, in the labor that acquires their daily subsistence, and in the hollowed remnants of time which ought to relieve their fatigues and soothe their cares, the influence will have been anticipated that such a government is not a pattern for the United States. If the United States mean to obtain or deserve the full praise due to wise and just governments, they will equally respect the rights of property and the property in rights. They will rival the government that most sacredly guards the former, and by repelling its example and violating the latter, will make themselves a pattern to that and all other governments. End of Property by James Madison The Puzzle of Mexico in Revolt by Arthur Rule. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Everybody has a guess. How many know the facts behind the uprising? Mexico City, March 8, 1911. The news that 20,000 United States troops were to mobilize in the Mexican border for maneuvers and that a fleet was proceeding to the Gulf waters, probably, as someone observed, to prevent ambitious Tarpon from violating the neutrality laws, came whispering out of the newspaper offices yesterday afternoon. All the town knows it this morning, and people are pouring over their papers all along the streets and gathering in front of the bulletin boards. Late last evening, on San Francisco Street, a man who was said never to have shown concern before advised me to lay in a stock of frijoles and averred that he was going to have a coat made with a Japanese flag covering the back. They're afraid of that, said he. Somebody saw somebody else who said he heard somebody shouting, Viva Madero, in the heart of the city about 10 o'clock this morning. Mr. Libantur close on the heels of a significant Paris interview, is nearing Mexico, and it really seems as if something new and definite might be about to happen. In these vivacious and alluring streets where, under a dazzling sun and in an air of spring sharpened, as it were, with autumnal frost, the 16th and 20th centuries jostle one another as in few other places in the world in the continuous presence of a drama which, however, masked by the brisk surfaces of development and trade, has at least an undertone of that already played in India, Egypt, and South Africa. Out of this bright, complex, and fascinating scene, it has not been easy to detach the bare bones of the revolutionary situation. To generalize about Mexico is useless. The fine folks drive up the paseo in melancholy state, pale and black, as if mourning a past that can never return. The patient brown substratum toils and smiles in childlike thoughtlessness at its poverty-stricken present. The foreign invaders, cigars gripped firmly in their teeth, stare straight ahead at the almighty dollar, and all these must somehow be reconciled and adjusted to life as it is. What a few men with rifles may do in this or that remote mountain pass or village seems far less impressive than what a great many men are doing everywhere with capital and machinery and modern business methods. 
What may happen tomorrow seems rather ephemeral compared with what will have happened in 50 or 100 years. Such irrelevant and perhaps sentimental considerations aside, it is still not easy to gather in a few words the many and dissociated threads of this long drawn out wrangle. Mexico is a difficult place to generalize about, a place where it is curiously the case that each man's facts are true only to his own experience. What is true in Chihuahua may be absurd in Colima. Things happen, not according to set rules, but because somebody who had the power wanted them to happen that way. The most radical insurrecto could scarcely ask for anything more than the constitution under which the country has theoretically been governed since 1857. At the border, they told me that the whole nation was only waiting for a spark, for one good life-sized grito to rise as a man. When I reached the capital, the fine horses of the gente decente were still spanking up and down the drive, the little newsboys filling the air with their wailing, locust-like cries of the names of papers not yet suppressed, and conservative Americans, who had spent many years in Mexico, asked if there was any revolution. Senor Creel's theory, a socialist movement, The other afternoon, I had the pleasure of talking for a few moments with Senor Enrique Creel, Minister of Foreign Affairs, late ambassador at Washington, member of a family which owns some millions of acres of land in the state of Chihuahua, and therefore a fine old feudal gentleman or a villainous despot, according to your point of view. And Mr. Creel told me, in the most urbane and charming English, that the so-called insurrection was confined to a few Los Angeles socialists and some local banditti who had neither property, position, nor the wherewithal to command respect. At lunch that day, the young American opposite me cheerfully informed me that all you needed was a hundred men to march up the Paseo de la Reforma and take Chapultepec. As the same young man went on to tell wholly ridiculous things about the border insurrectos, whom I happened to know something about. I was inclined to minimize the importance of his other observations, and it might have been suggested to Mr. Creel that if the revolutionists were rich, powerful, and cultured gentlemen like himself, they might not be so interested in rebelling. Nevertheless, this seems an appropriate moment for the statement of a few general facts, which can scarcely have been made clearer to newspaper readers at home by the disjointed rumors of a skirmish here, a bridge burned there, and which may, possibly, be lost sight of in the new centers of interest which seem now about to be gathering. There is a genuine revolution. Eliminating the border socialists, who, however altruistic their propaganda, would be insurrecting today against Taft just as much as against Diaz, if the chances of success were anything like the same, Setting them aside, and with them the soldiers of fortune and roustabouts who flock to any such disturbance as this, and from these two sources has come much of the newspaper copy printed in the States, ignoring the various outside influences which have been whispered about, and even Madero himself, there remains a very real and profound condition of unrest. Little of this has expressed itself in armed revolt. It is a state of mind, general increasing and inevitable. It is not aimed directly against President Diaz. Nothing can hide or destroy the fact that Diaz is one of the great men of his time, one of the world's great executives. There has been, to be sure, a perceptible change of feeling lately, even toward him, but it is irritation at what seems to be the stubbornness of old age, rather than any active hate for him, whom people speak of with almost a sort of filial affection as the old man. The feeling against Diaz's cabinet council. The dissatisfaction is with the men around him. The inevitable rottenness which has gathered during the nearly 35 years of his benevolent despotism. It is, for example, against the so-called scientificos, a group of rich, able, powerful men, some of them cabinet ministers, whose science is believed to consist in the skill with which they have combined government with private graft, and it is against the more personal tyranny, the caciquism of the state 
governors, and jefe políticos. It must be remembered, of course, that Mexico has been governed for the past 35 years with an iron hand, nominally a democracy with a constitution much like ours. She really has been ruled by one man who differed from other dictators less in the machinery he used than in the fact that he was genuinely able and personally honest. These governors and jefe políticos might be loosely compared to our own state governors and city mayors, with the difference that, although theoretically elected, they are practically appointed by the president, and they exert, each within his own sphere, a power we should regard as almost oriental in its ruthlessness and lack of responsibility to anyone except a man higher up. An American can visualize conditions somewhat, remembering, of course, all the initial differences by imagining President Grant, for instance, still in the White House. Diaz became provisional president in 1876, and the states arbitrarily governed by his personal friends who had come in with him and remained in power ever since, however unfitted by creeping tyranny and advancing decrepitude. Local dissatisfaction has been increased by the fact that governors are not infrequently taken from one state and placed over a part of the country with which they are quite unfamiliar, and perhaps out of sympathy. One need not go into specific details to make clear the result. Men will be men, as the lady said in one of Mr. Augustus Thomas's plays, especially white men in a tropical country. If there are graft and favoritism in the United States with frequent changes of administration, a vigilant press and a keen public sentiment hanging over the office holder's head, it does not require any very profound penetration to surmise what might happen during a continuous regime of nearly 35 years in a country saturated with the traditions of the Spanish conquest. Arbitrary arrests and punishments, extravagance, unnecessary public works, and even the more personal immoralities of which the Central American dictators have been accused are all laid at the doors of these petty chiefs. Yet the American will mistake the situation if he fancies that the whole system is going to be changed by any revolution or, indeed, that the far-seeing want it suddenly changed. I talked with one man, a humanitarian and sociologist, who frankly disbelieves in much of Mexico's development, and he spoke with considerable plausibility of the exploitation of a half-awakened pastoral people for the benefit of foreign bondholders. He would have everybody vote. Professional politicians might gobble up the power, yet he believed that it was better for the peon to have a vote to sell, so to speak, than not to have it at all. And I talked with another, on quite the opposite side, who thought one free and fair election might be a good thing to clear the air and, as he put it, show them how impossible it was. Few, however, of what would ordinarily be called practical men hope for any violent change in the political functions of this mass of the people. It is not that Diaz has ruled badly, but that he has ruled too long. They want changes in the cabinet, new governors and jefes, more autonomy, a series of intelligent oligarchies, rather than one hard and fast autocracy. Diaz was a fighter who came to the top because he was strong enough to fight his way there. He has held the nation together and made it. Granting everything that he has done for his country, one would still not be likely to endow him with any advanced humanitarianism or progressive statesmanship as these terms would be understood in modern England, for instance. These old governors are friends of his. They fought with him in his time of stress, and naturally, he has stood by them. So it is not strange that the world beyond Chapultepec has moved a bit beyond him. Mexico, during his administration, is vastly changed. Railroads, machinery, newspapers, the very schools which he started have had their effect. The present generation reads and thinks a little. Sitting in the patio of my hotel one morning, I showed a picture postcard of a group of border insurrectos to the young Mexican proprietor. He examined it with interest. Of course, he said, we're all insurrectos in a way. He pointed up to a balcony where a withered old gentleman, governor of one of the states, leaned on the railing, 
dreamily smoking the inevitable cigarette. You see him, he said. Well, he has been governor up there for, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 years. We young men feel we could do just as well as he is doing. We think we ought to have a chance. Just how profound this feeling may be, how much it is inspired by a genuine desire to accept the responsibilities of government, a casual visitor to Mexico would scarcely pretend to say. But this young man appeared to be a clean, capable, intelligent representative of what one might call young Mexico, the class to which his country must, and one would assume should, look for its present help. And this indeed, from the Mexican's point of view, seems to be the really important aspect of the present unrest, as it is the hardest about which to get any definite information. Out of all this complex mixture of socialism, big business, mere brigandage, and so on, how much can be sifted as the genuine protest of a growing middle class? Insurrectos have no real leader. These revolutions in mere tyranny are common enough. One could easily restrict oneself to northern sweatshops in certain aspects of life in our southern states and write a barbarous America quite as true, harrowing, and unfair as some of the things written recently about Mexico. Revolutions of the Central American variety are stale enough. The really significant thing is whether the present disturbance reflects a definite step forward, whether a class has grown up here which, given a little more chance to govern itself, will know how to use the chance. No one knows just what the insurrectos want, least of all themselves. They are too disorganized, too heterogeneous. They have no one man about whom to rally, no definite program of reform. Nobody takes Madero very seriously, although the vivas have been given in his name. He comes himself of one of the wealthy old feudal families. He is a spiritualist, a vegetarian, a dreamer, and in general about as likely a man to lead a revolt of the people as young Mr. Hyde, who went down in the insurance investigation, would be to lead an insurgent band of Kansas farmers. Nevertheless, the movement has already brought significant changes, changes which, had they been made sooner, might have staved off the present dissatisfaction. The other day, the governor of Puebla, one of the most notorious of the state chiefs, suddenly decided that he desired a rest from the long service which he had given to his country. The present governor of Chihuahua was put in to placate the people's irritation at having put over them a young relative of Mr. Creel. Similar changes have taken place elsewhere, and many more are rumored. Mr. Limantour's Frankness When Mr. Limantour, in his Paris interview a few weeks ago, and later in New York, stated that something must be done to reform the abuses in the municipalities and means devised to break up the enormous estates and give the people a chance at the idle land, well-informed men here said that it was the most significant announcement that had been made in 25 years. When it is recalled that Mr. Creel, one of Mr. Lehman Tour's colleagues in the cabinet, is the owner, or at least a member of the family which owns one of these enormous estates, Mr. Lehman Tour's frankness can be judged. The breaking up of these vast domains is generally regarded as the one thing which, more than any other, would help conditions today. The lands of these estates are almost untaxed, so that if the owner can make enough to permit him to live at ease in the capital, or Paris, or some other pleasant place, out of a part of his holdings, it is much simpler to leave the rest untouched. And there it lies wasted and unproductive, with the bulk of the people landless and frightfully poor. It is urged that taxation would force the big haciendados to break up their holdings. The transition from their hands into the hands of the people who really need the land presents many difficulties, not the least of which is the state of feudal dependence in which the people themselves have become accustomed to live. But at least a start would be made a start toward a class of small proprietors who would stand on their own feet and think for themselves. At no time have the insurrectos shown themselves very dangerous in the open field. Orozco and his men might easily have taken Juarez, but they foozled away their opportunity in the hills. 
Outbreaks elsewhere have not coalesced into anything that the federal troops could not handle when they really went at the difficulty in force. At the same time, the burning of bridges and tearing up of railroad tracks and telegraph lines, the raiding of towns and skirmishes with federal troops, goes on just as it has gone on for months. Foreign capital is responsible. In the North, the government is confronted with much the same situation that ours had to meet in dealing with the Apaches. The Apaches, indeed, used to fight and hide over the same country that Orozco is skipping about in now. Only in this case, the enemy is composed of quite modern men, very acutely aware of the fact that foreign capital will not forever stand by and see its business ruined. The big smelter at El Paso closed down day before yesterday because the supply of Mexican ore has been cut off and business in Chihuahua is said to be at a standstill. When there is talk of foreign intervention because the government is not able to handle the situation, this is what is really meant. There has been no indication that the government could not beat the insurrectos in a fair fight. There have been many indications that it could not prevent the insurrectos from hindering business. And Mexico is what she is today, materially, because of foreign capital. Americans alone are supposed to have nearly a billion dollars invested here. When, therefore, 20,000 American soldiers suddenly mobilize on the Mexican border, a certain new tension comes into the air, even though the army comes but to maneuver. Even though, in the thrilling Mexican sunshine, the little hooded Victorias scurry up and down as busily as ever, The ancient plazas are as dreamily sweet with orange blossoms, and in the cool shade of the Alameda or the Iturbide restaurant, the Dollar Princess is being played by the 97th Band. It is typical of Mexico and of the present disturbance that nobody knows what is going to happen, and that those who have been here a few days seem as able, and of course much more ready, prophets as those who have lived here for 20 years. The old way was to get your man down stand on his neck, and then perhaps you might talk of concessions. To the government, to old Don Porfirio, this naturally seems the only way. But they cannot get their many-headed man down. Perhaps it will be necessary to try a new way, to say, Here, this has gone on long enough. Whom do you want and what do you want? Let's talk it over frankly and get back to work. A news crisis. Of course, The mobilization of our troops seems a sort of crisis, a crisis at least in the news. But you have but to go into these busy streets and look about you. Look at that still unfinished new national theater, a gorgeous white marble palace thrice as magnificent as anything of the sort in the States, and the half-starved peons under it. See the army buying seven aeroplanes because a troop of birdmen, the first, happened to arrive in Mexico City, while the soldiers fighting in the north have no commissary department except a camp women following along. See new and old continually milling and clashing, just as they are clashing this instant in the patio of my hotel, once a monastery garden, where, in order to make room for an office building, they are chopping down trees four feet through that look as if they might have stood here for 300 years." It's a pity, I said to the porter at the gate the other day, on coming back to find the biggest of them down. See, he nodded slowly, pobrecito, poor little fellow. See the aristocracy with its archaic traditions, the plodding, half-awakened common people, the foreigner with his keen eyes and initiative and money. See all this and the many forces harrying the state, and remember that no matter what happens tomorrow or next day, the hand that has held all these fascinatingly chaotic forces together for 30 years is the hand of an old warrior nearly 83 who cannot, it would seem, step forward or backward or peacefully give the reins over to someone else. The mere facts as they are make crisis enough. End of Puzzle of Mexico in Revolt by Arthur Rule Thomas A. Edison, Greatest of Inventors, by Charles D. Lanier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. In this world's fair year, we may be forgiven an excess of national self-consciousness which leads us to ask where we stand among the peoples of the earth, to cast about for the significance of this young cis-Atlantic civilization. The answer is writ large over the length and breadth of the continent in our huge railway systems, containing more than half the track mileage of the entire world, and the telegraph lines beside them, in the network of wires over and under our great cities, in the transoceanic cables with which, a quarter of a century ago, we brought the old world within speaking distance of the new, and in the strange machines, telephones, phonographs, dynamos, which have revolutionized our industries and which will certainly revolutionize our whole society. In short, we are a nation of mechanics and inventors, this will clearly be our meaning to the historical students of a thousand years hence, as we say today that Greece bequeathed art to the world and Rome's heritage was law. An age of electricity and Edison is its prophet. But half a century ago, one might have felt secure in asserting that the great engineering triumphs of the age had come through the application of steam. And now, already, the more subtle agency of electricity has thrown the work of Watt and Stevenson and Fulton from the category of marvels and bids fair to supersede it altogether. Steam came but to prepare the way for the ever-present, all-powerful fluid, and we are being ushered into an age of electricity. Curiously enough, there is among us an unassuming citizen who sums up in his personality and achievements this genius of the race, who is, one might almost say, to America what Caesar was to Rome. If one were to ask what individual best symbolized this industrial regeneration for which we as a nation will stand, it would be marvelously easy to answer Thomas Alva Edison. The precocious self-reliance and restless energy of the new world, its brilliant defiance of traditions, the immediate adaptation of means to ends, and above all, the distinctive inventive faculty reached in him their apogee. The mere mass of this extraordinary man's work gives in itself a striking idea of the force which he exerts in our material progress. Up to a few days ago, the government had granted Edison no less than 720 patents, while he had in addition 150 applications on file and this during a working period that has not yet brought him within many years of the grand climacteric, and much of it accomplished in the face of discouraging financial obstacles. The Boyhood of a Genius For Mr. Edison is but 46 years of age. He comes of Dutch parentage, the family having emigrated to America in 1730. His great-grandfather was a banker of high standing in New York. Thomas Edison was born in Erie County, Ohio. When he was but a child of seven, the family fortunes suffered reverses so serious as to make it necessary that he should become a wage earner at an unusually early age and that the family should move from his birthplace to Michigan. Only four years later, the boy was reading Newton's Principia, with the entirely logical result of becoming deeply and permanently disgusted with pure mathematics. Indeed, he seems to have displayed all the due precocity of genius, one of his notable feats about this time being an attempt to read through the entire Free Library of Detroit. Newsboy, editor, and chemist at 15. Nor was he, by any means, a youthful bookworm and dreamer. The distinctly practical bent of his character was shown in his operations as newsboy on the Grand Trunk Railway, especially in the brilliant coup by which in 1869 he bought up on futures a thousand copies of the Detroit Free Press containing important war news and gaining a little time on his rivals, sold the entire batch like hotcakes, so that the price reached 25 cents a paper before the end of his route. It was at this period, too, that he was posing as editor of the Grand Trunk Herald, a weekly periodical of very modest proportions issued from the train on which he traveled. 
He had also begun to dabble in chemistry and fitted up to that end a small itinerant laboratory. During the progress of some occult experiments in this workshop, certain complications ensued in which a jolted and broken bottle of sulfuric acid attracted the attention of the conductor. He, who had been long-suffering in the matter of unearthly odors, promptly ejected the young devotee and all his works. This incident would have been only amusing had it not been rendered deplorable from the lasting deafness which resulted from a box on the ear, administered by the irate conductor in the course of the young scientist Higuera. Edison transferred the laboratory to his father's cellar and diligently studied telegraphy, establishing a line between his home and a boy partner's with the help of an old river cable, sundry links of stovepipe wire, and glass bottle insulators. A heroic tuition fee. Dramatic situations appear at every turn of this man's life, though temperamentally he would be the last to seek them. He seems to be continually arriving on the scene at critical moments to take the conduct of affairs into his own hands. It was on one of these occasions when he snatched a station master's child from before an approaching train that he earned his first lessons in telegraphy from the father. So apt a pupil was he that the railroad company soon gave him regular employment, and at 17 he had become one of the most expert operators on the road. Not a prig by any means. There was a saving human quality of error in the boy to amply redeem him from the colorless perfection of the storybook model. One is almost glad to hear that he was not by any means a paragon as an operator and that he played tricks on the company by inventing a device which would automatically send in the signal to show he was awake at his post what time he comfortably snored in the corner. Some such boyish mischief soon sent him in disgrace over the line to Canada. The heavy winter had cut off telegraphic connections and all other means of communication between the place in which he was sojourning and the American town of Sarnier. With characteristic promptness and originality, Edison mounted a locomotive and tooted a telegraphic message again and again across the river until the Americans understood and answered in kind. Among the Tramp Telegraphers For the next few years, Edison was successively in charge of important wires in Memphis, Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Louisville. He lived in the free and easy atmosphere of the Tramp operators, a boon companion with them, yet absolutely refusing to join in the dissipations to which they were professionally addicted. He has always been a total abstainer and a singularly moderate man in everything but work, for which he is a perfect glutton. Many are the stories current of the timely aid given his rollicking colleagues when their potations had led them into trouble. It was their custom, when a spree was on the tapas, to make him the custodian of those funds which they felt obliged to save. On a more than usual hilarious occasion, one of them returned rather the worst for the wear and knocked the treasurer down on his refusal to deliver the trust money. The other depositors, we are glad to say, gave the ungentlemanly tippler a sound thrashing. But though Edison could be trusted with his colleagues' money, he was himself in a chronic state of penury, since he devoted every cent, regardless of future needs, to scientific books and materials for experiments. Nor was he in any great favor with his employers. They wanted operators, not inventors, so they, not unreasonably, said, The Louisville press gives him a state dinner. At one time, he was in such straits that a necessary journey from Memphis to Louisville had to be performed on foot. At the Louisville station, he was offered excellent chances to put his extraordinary skill to use. He had perfected a style of handwriting which would allow him to take from the wire in very legible longhand 47 and even 54 words a minute. As he was but a moderately rapid sender, he invented an automatic help which enabled him to record the matter at leisure and send it off as fast as was needed. Of this Louisville stay, one of his biographers says, True to his dominant instincts, 
He was not long in gathering around him a laboratory, printing office, and machine shop. He took press reports during his whole stay, including on one occasion the presidential message and veto of the District of Columbia by Andrew Johnson, and this at one sitting from 3.30 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. He then paragraphed the matter received over the wires so that each printer had exactly three lines, thus enabling a column to be set up in two or three minutes' time. For this, he was allowed all the exchanges he desired, and the Louisville Press gave him a state dinner. Edison astonishes the Eastern operators. In 1868, Edison attracted much attention by a device utilizing one submarine cable for two circuits. It won him a position in the Franklin Telegraph office of Boston. He came east with no ready money and in a rather dilapidated condition. His colleagues were tempted by his hayseed appearance to salt him, as professional slang terms the process of giving a receiver matter faster than he can record it. For this purpose, the new man was assigned to a wire manipulated by a New York operator famous for his speed. But there was no fun at all. Notwithstanding the fact that the New Yorker was in the game and was doing his most speedy clip, Edison wrote out the long message accurately, and when he realized the situation, was soon firing taunts over the wire at the sender's slowness. His first patent, it worked too well. A year later, Edison received his first patent, a machine for recording votes and designed to be used in the state legislature. It was an ingenious device by which the votes were clearly printed and shown on a roll of paper by a small machine attached to the desk of each member. The invention was never used, and Mr. Edison tells with a comical twinkle in his eyes how amazed he was to hear on presenting it to the authorities that such an innovation was out of the question, that the better it worked, the more impossible it would be, for its use would destroy the most precious right of the minority, that of filibustering. The inventor thinks, however, that he received quite the worth of his trouble in the lesson taught him to make sure of the practical need of and demand for a machine before spending his energies on it. Astray in the Streets of New York in this same year, Edison came to New York, friendless and in debt, on account of the expenses of his experiments. For several weeks, he wandered about the town with actual hunger staring him in the face. It was a time of great financial excitement, and with that strange quality of opportunism, which one would think had been woven into his destiny, he entered the establishment of the Law Gold Reporting Company, just as their entire plant had shut down on account of an accident in the machinery that could not be located. The heads of the firm were anxious and excited to the last degree, and a crowd of the Wall Street fraternity waited about for the news which came not. The shabby stranger put his finger on the difficulty at once and was given lucrative employment. In the rush of the metropolis, a man finds his true level without delay, especially when his talents are of so practical and brilliant a nature as were this young telegraphers. It would be an absurdity to imagine an Edison hidden in New York. Within a short time, he was presented with a check for $40,000 as his share of a single invention, an improved stock printer. From this time, a national reputation was assured him. He was, too, now engaged on the duplex and quadruplex systems, which were almost to inaugurate a new era in telegraphy. Working 20 hours daily for 15 years. Do you have regular hours, Mr. Edison? I asked not long ago. Oh, he said, I do not work hard now. I come to the laboratory about 8 o'clock every day and go home to tea at 6, and then I study or work on some problem until 11, which is my hour for bed. 14 or 15 hours a day can scarcely be called loafing, I suggested. Well, he replied, for 15 years I have worked on an average 20 hours a day. That astonishing brain has been known to puzzle for 60 successive hours over a refractory problem, its owner dropping quietly off into a long sleep when the job was done, 
to awake perfectly refreshed and ready for another siege. Mr. Dixon, a neighbor and familiar, gives an anecdote told by Edison which well illustrates his untiring energy and phenomenal endurance. In describing his Boston experience, Edison said he bought Faraday's works on electricity, commenced to read them at 3 o'clock in the morning, and continued until his roommate arose when they started on their long walk to get breakfast. That end, however, was entirely subordinated in Edison's mind to Faraday, and he suddenly remarked to his friend, Adams, I have got so much to do and life is so short that I have got to hustle. And with that, I started off on a dead run for my breakfast. Men sana in corpor sano. Mr. Edison's fine gray eye is the clearest I ever looked into and his fresh, wholesome complexion and substantial though not by any means corpulent figure, are not better described than by the stock phrase, the picture of health. There is none of the lean and hungry look of the overworked student about him. His face, though strongly, even magnificently chiseled, is almost boyish in its smoothness, and in his manner there is that flavor of perfect simplicity and cheery goodwill given only to the very great. He is one of the most accessible of men, and only reluctantly allows himself to be hedged in from certain interviewers of the base sort. Mr. Edison is always glad to see any visitor, said a gentleman who is continually with him, except when he is hot on the trail for something he has been working for, and then it is as much as a man's head is worth to come in on him. The inventor describes himself as possessing only a fair amount of manual dexterity in the manipulation of machinery yet he generally controls with his own fingers the mechanism of his experiments. There have been associated with him during his working history two or three gentlemen who have materially aided him, where a second brain and hand are needed. These cooperative experiments have been carried on in a very pleasant atmosphere of camaraderie. How Mr. Edison Invents His genius comes near to justifying that definition of the word, which makes it an infinite capacity for taking pains. Are your discoveries often brilliant intuitions? Do they come to you while you are lying awake nights? I asked him. I never did anything worth doing by accident, he replied, nor did any of my inventions come indirectly through accident, except the phonograph. No, when I have fully decided that a result is worth getting, I go ahead on it and make trial after trial until it comes. I have always kept, continued Mr. Edison, strictly within the limits of commercially useful inventions. I have never had any time to put on electrical wonders, valuable simply as novelties to catch the popular fancy. And he named in distinction some noted electricians who had made their reputations through the pyrotechnics of the profession. He hates a telephone. What makes you work, I asked with real curiosity. What impels you to this constant, tireless struggle? You have shown that you care comparatively nothing for the money it makes, and you have no particular enthusiasm in the attending fame. I like it, he answered, after a moment of puzzled expression, and then he repeated his reply several times, as if mine was a proposition that had not occurred to him before. I like it. I don't know any other reason. You know, some people like to collect stamps. Anything I have begun is always on my mind, and I am not easy while away from it until it is finished, and then I hate it. Hate it? I asked, struck by his emphatic tones. Yes, he affirmed. When it is all done and is a success, I can't bear the sight of it. I haven't used a telephone in ten years, and I would go out of my way any day to miss an incandescent light. The Inventor versus the Patent Pirate Mr. Edison waxes eloquent and righteously indignant over the treatment which the inventor is only too apt to receive. He thinks that it is flying in the face of providence to patent an important discovery, for a race of professional sharks has arisen to dispute, with absolute disregard of facts, priority of claim to valuable patents. The better known the patentee, the more liable are they to swarm about with suborned witnesses. Mr. Edison has no fault to find with the patent law in this matter, 
but condemns strongly the practice of the United States Circuit Court in issuing injunctions forbidding an inventor to use his discovery until the case is decided, a period often covering years. He maintains that this works great injustice to the honest parties to a suit and that there is no protection in patents at all. However, I am glad to see that Bradstreet rates your credit at $3 million, I remarked. It did not come from my inventions, he said quickly. I never made money as a professional inventor. What property I own has been accumulated since I began to do business and manufacture the machines in my own shop. That is the only hope of the inventor. He will starve if he depends on his patents. Those who have been associated with Mr. Edison add that he has been fleeced by unscrupulous lawyers and patent sharks so unmercifully that it is only to be wondered he has any faith left in mankind. This is surely a national shame when one remembers that his earnings have always been valued by him only as a means of furnishing laboratories to give the world newer and more wonderful mechanical servants. And there is partial comfort in the thought that the great inventor has finally been able to surround himself, first at Newark, then at Menlo Park, and now at Orange, with all the most elaborate paraphernalia of his magic, with the most delicate and powerful instruments alike. Since Mr. Edison has begun to pose as a capitalist, he has broadened the borders of his phylacteries by considerable investments in the New Jersey lands containing magnetic iron ore and is now quite a mining property not far from his workshop. He will practically found a new industry if his experiments in ore separating succeed, an attempt for new methods that will so reduce the work of extracting the ore from the dirt and stones as to bring on a paying basis numbers of mines that are now on the wrong side of the margin of profit. Nearby, in the Orange Mountains, he has a pretty home, presided over by a charming wife, his second, and three children, of whom the oldest boy is beginning an apprenticeship in his father's work. The Estimate of a Twenty Years Associate Perhaps no one is in a position to give a truer estimate of the inventor as he appears beyond the threshold of his laboratory than Mr. Edward H. Johnson, who was associated with him in the disillusioning atmosphere of business for 20 years. Mr. Johnson himself is a type of American which is a necessary complement to creative genius such as Edison's. He has shown a masterly ability to comprehend the intricate problems of organizing and conducting the great companies by whose agency inventions such as the incandescent light and the phonograph could be brought to the people all over America, a work than which affairs of state themselves call for scarcely less breadth of view, talent for combination, and executive force. He characterizes Edison as genial and even frolicsome, with a temperament which might even be called boyish. In the whole course of our connection, says Mr. Johnson, and notwithstanding the many strains on his temper and the injustices which he suffered from unscrupulous business antagonists, we have never had but one difference. That was based on a pure misunderstanding and has long since died a natural death. My association with him has been of the greatest profit and pleasure to me. Our active friendship will end only with the death of one of us, though our business relations have ceased in the course of the natural ramification of the electric light and power industries, with which I became more intimately identified than did his other laboratory associates. He is a reluctant lion. Though Mr. Edison is social in his nature, even to the point of jollity, he is thoroughly averse to the formulas of a conventional society. Can we expect men who work 20 hours a day to cultivate the more elaborate graces? This is in some sort to be regretted, especially from the point of view of the circles, which, if he were otherwise minded, would be open to him, for he is really a brilliant conversationalist. But while society loses a lion, the world gains a genius. He has often been heard, continued Mr. Johnson, in his courteous answers to my questions, to express contempt 
for an inventor who, having produced a single invention, makes a tour of society to receive its plaudits, and finding the life so agreeable, pursues it permanently to the destruction of his further ambition. Mr. Johnson deplores this hiding of Edison's delightful personality under the bushel of reserve and wishes that he might be gently and tactfully lured into the social world, which, when once he had confidence in his command of its technicalities, he could not but greatly enjoy. But perhaps it is well to remember that the fearful and wonderful thing we call society was made neither by nor for geniuses, and he is only a genius. No, clearly the world is ready enough to grant him hero worship, but it is rather as we see him at noon taking his workmanlike lunch basket on his knees, or as we hear of his being refused admittance to his own laboratory by a new porter, who sees nothing in him but a suspicious-looking person in a slouch hat, than as a candidate for initiation into the sartorial and other mysteries of the beau monde. As well as these may be in their way, they are utterly foreign to the most picturesque and lovable aspects of Edison. The inventor as a businessman. It is told that in the halcyon days of Mr. Edison's earlier manufactories, he absolutely refused to have any system of bookkeeping and even kept no record at all of notes to be paid. When these fell due, he would drop everything and scurry around to raise the necessary funds. This on the principle, as he put it, that the notary's fee on the protested note was cheaper than keeping books. He has learned much since then in the stern regime of the business world, but it is still the unqualified opinion of many true friends that both the world and Mr. Edison would have been gainers if he had left the conduct of the purely business side of his affairs to associates of special commercial training and instincts. For the inventor has an intolerance of forms in business as in society. He undertook an active part in the management of the industries he had created in consequence of his disappointment at the slow development of the electric lighting venture. Mr. Johnson gives him credit for fertility of resource and brilliancy of conception in his business management, but easily shows how little these avail in the exacting world of commerce when not backed by the patient pursuit of an established order. This natural disregard for the forms and minutia of business affairs has led to anything but a path of roses for Mr. Edison in his financial operations. A sensitive nature. He is frank and open to a degree, said Mr. Johnson, and despite many a sad experience, as well as oft-repeated expressions of cynicism under the sense of injustice, he is always ready with sympathy and an open hand. When he feels himself injured, he is bitter for a time, but this passes away unless fed by the active hostility of an opponent. He is extremely sensitive to criticism of his motives, and is even too apt to interpret a light remark to mean a great disparagement. When he is robbed of money, he will easily forget it, but if attainted in any moral sense, he becomes relentless. Edison's Place Among the World's Scientists It might seem an infelicitous place for such a heading in the midst of a discussion of his business relations, but his achievements cannot be separated from commerce. He is an inventor not a discoverer of underlying laws and mathematical formulas. The keynote of his work is commercial utility. He is willing to make mathematics, pure science, his servant, but as an end in itself, he has no taste for it. He sees in every idea that ever taxed his brain a direct, immediate worth to the people about him, though it may not be within the limits of human imagination to comprehend the extent of that worth. The masses of his fellows and their needs are regarded in every test, in every experiment, in the most daring new conception, and in the most homely improvement alike. He asks himself when a new idea is suggested, will this be valuable from the industrial point of view? Will it do some important thing better than existing methods? And then, if the answer is clearly affirmative, can I carry it out? He is not so much a seeker after truth 
as he is a mighty engine for the application of scientific truths through unexpected and marvelous channels to the fight we are making in the patient modern way. He is an inventor purely and the greatest of his race. One might call him the Democrat of science, a wizard at work. It is a sign not to be passed over without thought that the first chamber the visitor entered on invading Mr. Edison's workshop at Orange is a library with voluminous and closely packed shelves. It is the sumptuous room of the establishment and with a further store of volumes at his home contains one of the most costly and well-equipped scientific libraries in the world. The collection of writings on patent laws and patents, for instance, is absolutely exhaustive. It gives in a glance an idea of the breadth of thought and sympathy of this man who grew up with scarcely a common school education. Nor will one find this self-taught and self-made scientist only a gigantic specialist. He will respond to any topic of real interest and value, will talk intelligently and quote appositely. But while it is significant to note that Mr. Edison's sympathies have not been dwarfed by his early limitations, yet it is the character of specialist, after all, in which he enchains our attention. A more profound impression of him comes when he stands in his roomy but topsy-turvy laboratory with its two well-hung and well-locked doors, or when he is directing the assistants and skillful workmen who follow his behest with something nearly akin to reverence. The inventor told me that in the huge system of electrical manufactories with which he is associated, no very large proportion of the best helpers come from the colleges, so many of which now have special courses in the new profession. The college training has the danger of spoiling them for the necessary rough manual labor. For a long time, we used to apply a test here when a new man came in. He was told that one of his duties would be to sweep the floor in the morning. This, of course, only to try him. But if he bridled up and resented it as an insult, we knew that he could never be of much use as an electrician. The Weapons of Magic Two centuries ago, Edison would have had a poor chance to escape the stake if the good citizens of Salem had taken an awed peep at the uncanny materials of his stockroom. In these multitudinous drawers and shelves lurk unearthly relics of birds, beasts, plants, and crawling things. The skins of snakes and fishes, the pelts of an extraordinary number of fur-bearing animals, some of them exceedingly rare the hide and teeth of sharks and hippopotami, rhinoceros horns, the fibers of strange exotic plants, all manner of textile substances and precious stones from the uttermost parts of the earth are there waiting to bridge over their destined gap in some important machine. Many of the great inventions have awaited a laborious trial of this infinite variety of material before they became practical. That, said Mr. Edison, pointing to a globe and closing the filament of the incandescent light, never would work right, no matter how hard we tried, till the fiber of a particular kind of bamboo was put in. The marvelously delicate, quivering, elastic thread which we have all seen. The phonograph, too, was only perfected after finding the value of the hard sapphire stone for several of its parts, the reproducing ball, the recording knife, and others. Storing up a symphony concert. A later development of the musical phonograph is the last device which Mr. Edison has perfected. It is now on the point of being introduced to the world. The cylinders of this instrument can record the most elaborate musical instrumentation. We sat down before it with the inventor and listened for half an hour to various selections from popular composers. It is hard to believe, but the machine has been so delicately constructed that the very quality of tone in most instruments was preserved. This effect is its special value, which Mr. Edison has spent much work in attaining. One feels tempted to pinch oneself to break the dream when the violin's long-drawn notes with their sympathy and pathos, the cello's marvelous tone, the firm, clear reed sounds of the flute, and the cornet's blare are ground out of this insignificant bundle of bolts and bars, the whole of which one might almost get into a peck measure. It is a sight to be remembered. 
the picture of Mr. Edison quietly listening with rapt enjoyment till the last strains of Cavaliera Rusticana had died away, only moving to put on a new tune, or once in a while, with a slight touch, to try if increased pressure on some lever would improve the quality of the tone. He promises in time to have this phonograph reproducing all the harmonics of its musical record, as well as the first tones. A single invention saves $15 million. Perhaps it will give a better idea of what Mr. Edison's work means to the world than any generalization or enumeration to simply state that the duplex and quadruplex systems of telegraphy, begun by him in 1869 and finished after six years of work, have saved in America alone the enormous sum of $15 million. By the duplex system, two currents of different degrees of strength were sent over the wire in the same direction, thus doubling its efficiency, while the quadruplex arrangement became possible when it was discovered that these two currents could be sent in opposite directions at the same time, thus enabling one wire to transmit four simultaneous messages. Not satisfied with this, Mr. Edison is confident of attaining sextuplex and octuplex systems. Instruments of Marvelous Delicacy measuring a millionth degree Fahrenheit. Through the mysterious qualities of a carbon button, Mr. Edison has been able to construct a little machine called the tazimeter, which in different forms measures degrees of heat, of moisture, and in the odoroscope and microphone of odors and sound so small that it is difficult for the human mind to grasp the situation. The tazimeter will show a sensible deflection at the one millionth of a degree of Fahrenheit. The heat from the human body standing eight feet away will be accurately registered. A lighted cigar held at the same distance will give a large deflection, as will the heat of a common gas jet 100 feet away. When it is arranged to be sensitive to moisture, this astonishing instrument was deflected 11 degrees by a drop of water held on the finger five inches away. The microphone multiplies the intensity of sound by the hundred thousand, making the passage of the tiniest insect sound like a mighty deafening roar. The greatest triumphs are yet to come. Electrical science is in its infancy. Those who are greatest in the march of mechanical progress confidently predict that future discoveries will be as incredible to us as the present science would be to our forebears of two centuries back. One single further secret, one from nature, will open a practically limitless field for electrical introduction and will probably be more decided in its quantitative results, as the technicians say, than any invention the world has seen. It is the direct production of electricity from oxygen and coal, carbon. At present, we burn coal to obtain steam, which is transmuted into mechanical energy and thence into electricity. Before the energy of the coal reaches the dynamo, six-sevenths of its power are lost, even under the very best conditions, and afterwards one-tenth of the remainder. Find a way to dispense with a steam engine in this making of electricity, and we have multiplied several times the available mechanical energy of the world. Thousands of the brightest and most earnest engineers and chemists are now striving, generally in secret, to obtain this gigantic result, beside which the philosopher's stone was but a bauble. Edison has worked on it and confidently predicts that the discovery will come. He asserts that he is no longer troubling himself about it, but he has a very well-equipped chemical laboratory in which, nowadays, he spends most of his time. And if he happens upon this secret, we have no idea that he will let it pass by unnoticed. When we shall have made this eternal saving in our fuel supply, the Atlantic steamships will need only a snug little coal bin for 250 tons of coal instead of one for 2,500 tons. There will be no more forced draughts and grimy, consumptive stokers, and the five-day record will be an uninteresting reminiscence. The great English shipbuilders can already construct a vessel to go 40 knots an hour 
If only she could burn 2,000 tons of coal a day, then she will only have to burn 200. Then it will take only one twentieth of an ounce of coal to carry a ton one mile. Nor is it only the sanguine dream of inventors, this magnificent discovery. So cool-headed a businessman as Mr. Johnson, whom I have been quoting from before, believes that we shall certainly have the problem solved early in the next century. It will, he adds, make short work of machinery now run by electricity. The greatest future of electricity, he adds, is in its quality of a power agent. Light and heat it will give, but power is the grand field for its employment. All that is required is cheap production. The means of utilizing it effectively and economically are even now more perfect than in the case of the steam engine or the horse. Niagara in Harness While our industrious alchemists search for the great secret, we are doing the best in our power to make up for the inefficiency of steam by utilizing the energy of streams. In the falls of Niagara, there are about 3 million horsepower hitherto wasted, but now a portion of this monster force is in the traces. 100,000 horsepower is caught by giant turbines, is transformed into electricity on the spot, and then sent over wires to distant points to give light and turn wheels. The silent, invisible power is to be taken to the city of Buffalo or even farther, and as a local result, that town is already looking forward to a population of one million. It helps us to realize our gain on nature when we think that even this bit stolen from Niagara, only one three hundredth of her might, is equivalent to the continuous work, night and day, of six hundred thousand men. The question at once arises, why we do not utilize all the Niagara power and run every piece of machinery in New York City with it. Perhaps someday we may, but at present there is a practical limit to the long-distance transmission of power which puts this feat out the question. At great distances there is too much resistance to be overcome to make it commercially efficient, and the personal equation of the men who have the machinery in charge must always be taken into account, said Mr. Edison. No machinery can be much beyond the conception of the men who run it. That is a point seldom thought of, but ever present in the consideration of these new problems. We may travel 150 miles per hour. It is now but a question of time when the mantle of the steam locomotive will fall on the electric car. The latter has made the first advances towards supplanting steam in such work as is required in the long b &O tunnel under the city of Baltimore where whole trains, even freight trains with their locomotives attached, are hauled six or seven miles by powerful electric motors. The engineers studying the practical details of electrical locomotion are still uncertain as to whether we shall have a separate locomotive drawing the future train or whether each car will be equipped with its own motor. The possible speed is to be limited only by the problems of the cohesion of steel in the rails and engines. I asked Mr. Edison what, in his opinion, was the practical speed limit on the horizon of electrical locomotion, and he answered, perhaps 150 miles an hour. He made at Menlo Park one of the first important experiments in electrical railways, exhibiting one in 1882 that carried cars 40 miles per hour. But before we come to moving heavy trains by electricity, to which there are serious, though not insuperable, obstacles, he believes that we shall shoot our mail through the country by some electrical device, of Telfridge construction possibly. The social aspects of city railways. But perhaps the most far-reaching results of the introduction of electrical transportation will be seen in our city and suburban railways. That was, after all, but a feeble bit of philosophy which said time is money. For when the problems of our congested centers of population are considered, time is green fields and running brooks, fresh air and cream and butter and eggs. It is life and health and happiness for the ill-fed, ill-housed, untaught class which our social and industrial systems constrain to exist in city tenement houses. When the fathers of such families, as we now see in Mulberry and Cherry Streets, 
can go every night to their country homes 30 miles away from work in half as many minutes for five cents, then we shall be well on our way to a signal solution of the ugliest questions of the day. If electrical city railways will eventually help to emancipate the workmen and stab anarchy under the fifth rib, they will also much more directly be doing a good deed in emancipating the streetcar horse than which there is no more ill-used or degraded creature judged by his possibilities in the animal or vegetable kingdom, and in doing so, they will help to clean our streets and purify the heavily taxed atmosphere of great cities. A Profession for the Masses The birth of the beneficent science has brought with it an entirely new profession, and, as is well and fitting, a profession which less than any of its older brethren is isolated by laws of caste or need of money. It has opened an honorable, lucrative occupation to the masses, and it has aided in the century's movement toward presenting in our college courses the widest opportunities for practical and technical instruction as opposed to the old-time classical system. Never before in the history of the world have boys with dexterous hands and inquiring logical brains had such a chance as now lies before them. And not only boys, a social good of the highest importance has come in the field that certain delicate operations in electrical manufacture have given to women wage earners. In the Edison manufactories alone, thousands of girls are using their skillful fingers and finely gauged judgment to finish the sapphire portions of the phonograph to make and test the thread-like bamboo filaments of the incandescent light. They are more to be relied on than boys in the nice manipulation of these and other frail portions of the machinery. An opportunity for our economists. Of vast economic and social significance will be the opportunity that our new systems of transportation, communication, and lighting will offer to correct any mistakes that we may have made in the industries which economists call natural monopolies. Whatever we may finally decide as to the advisability of government control of railroads and telegraphs and lighting plants, still there will be the fight, if it appears that the government should operate these, to induce the present owners to agree with us an almost hopeless task. But with the advent of electric roads and lights, and with such rivals of the telegraph and telephone as Professor Gray's Telautograph may prove the advocates of government ownership will have their chance. This is strikingly exemplified in the history of municipal control of lighting plants, where the towns willing to undertake the responsibility of electric plants are to those that would assume ownership of gas as 10 to 1. Electricity as a lifesaver. It will never be known how many lives have been saved by the introduction of electric lighting in our houses and streets in the stead of oil and gas. At first, this might have seemed of dubious advantage when one heard stories of the fires which resulted from lighting wires and of men and horses killed in trolley accidents. But since the improved methods of insulating have been applied, and it is to be expected that more and more of the dangerous wires will be carried underground. There can be no suspicion but that we have gained immensely in safety from fire. And this is of twofold importance on trains and in ships, where fire so often leads to holocausts. Railroad accidents have been lessened in another way, primarily, of course, by telegraphic dispatches, without which we cannot imagine our great roads in use at all and also in the later inventions by which one can telegraph from a moving train, currents being induced in the wires running parallel to the road. It seems to a layman little short of miraculous that the sender can tick on his instrument while the Chicago flyer in which he is traveling is making 60 miles an hour and send a message by this wonderful property of induction over wires which may be so much as 500 feet away. In certain of the great railroad central offices, there are charts in which all the trains at the moment in use are represented in miniature in the relative positions they actually occupy, the movements being electrically recorded. And when heating by electricity comes into general use, as it certainly will, 
we shall be advantaged further by immunity from the deadly car stove. In the ocean, greyhounds that are again and again cutting off the distance between Europe and America, electrical devices are of signal service in reducing the danger to life. The wearing on the ship's enormous shaft is announced when it gets to the danger point to the engineer by a little electric bell which tinkles automatically, the bearing having closed a circuit on reaching a certain fixed point in the shaft. The terrible danger of collision with icebergs will be lessened through an application of that same small carbon button which registered a millionth of a degree of heat. An apparatus has already been arranged to effect this. The nearing bergs announcing their presence through the increasing cold which the tasimeter records. Collisions and other dangers of navigation are rendered much less formidable, too, by the powerful electric searchlights, equal to many thousand candle power, that disclose objects for miles about in their mighty glare. A hundred years hence, we shall almost certainly be flying. The greatest difficulty at present in the way of that pleasing performance is the weight of the motor and fuel relative to the power necessary. The chemical production of electricity will sweep away that obstacle by making possible the construction of motors weighing but a small fraction of the lightest now constructed, and by effecting an even more decided saving in fuel. As one result of the flying machine among the many which it will affect even revolutionary in character, a writer has pointed out that we shall probably be delivered from the institution of war, since such terrible destruction will be possible with a corps of fighting airplanes that no nation will dare to risk it. Farming by electricity has been successfully tried in the southern states, and it is not improbable that we shall see the agriculturalist of the future sawing his wood, cutting his ensilage, shelling his corn, threshing his wheat, and running his creamery with power from a small electric plant owned in cooperation with a half dozen of his neighbors. We should be whisking our heavy baggage, too unwieldy for the airplanes, through the country by electricity applied to some telferage or other system. We shall be cooking by electricity and heating and lighting our houses, our cars, and our ships. We shall not only cook our meals, we shall probably serve them too, to judge from an experiment made not long ago in Baltimore with much eclat, seeing, hearing, and thinking by electricity. But these methods fairly seem old-fashioned beside some of the feats which our most daring electricians are considering as possible. If we hear by electricity through the telephone, why, do these undismayed men ask, can we not see at a distance by the same agency? The vibrations of light are, to be sure, many times more rapid than those of sound, but it is merely a question of obtaining a diaphragm which will respond to those vibrations. May we not look forward to seeing, from our easy armchair in New York, the latest drama at the Théâtre Francais? And since hearing is but a tickling of the brain by vibrations, may we not, if our apparatus for introducing these vibrations to the brain centers gets out of order, if, in short, we are deaf, lead the impulses to the brain through the bones of the head by electrical means? With the problems of seeing and hearing by electricity established, there is not so wide a gap to bridge over to the idea of thought transference by the same means. Everything they have observed leads our psychologists and physiologists to suspect that the impulses from the brain along the nerves to the muscles are, if not electric, at any rate, inextricably combined with electrical phenomena. All of us know the simple experiment in our physiological lessons of making an electrical impulse act on a frog's muscles as an act of volition from the brain. If it be true that thinking is, or is always accompanied by, an electrical disturbance, why should we not be able to induce thoughts in other people's brains corresponding to our own? Mr. Edison worked on this bizarre problem with much earnestness. He and his assistant, Mr. Batchelor, fitted up their craniums with a coil of wire each and connecting the two with a string, impregnated successively with various conducting substances, the thinkers thought away sturdily, testing, at intervals, the effect on each other. 
Many times, said Mr. Edison, their hearts were in their mouths with the belief that the connection had been established. But on laying traps for one another, it was invariably found that the result was but the product of their strained imaginations. End of Thomas A. Edison, Greatest of Inventors, by Charles D. Lanier. Treaty of Shimonoseki by John Watson Foster, Li Hongzang, Li Jing Fang, Ito Hirobumi, and Matsu Munimitsu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed April 17th, 1895, ratified at Shifu, May 8th, 1895. Article 1. China recognizes definitively the full and complete independence and autonomy of Korea, and in consequence the payment of tribute and the performance of ceremonies and formalities by Korea to China in derogation of such independence and autonomy shall wholly cease for the future. Article 2. China cedes to Japan in perpetuity and full sovereignty the following territories together with all fortifications, arsenals, and public property thereon. A. The southern portion of the province of Fengtian, within the following boundaries. The line of demarcation begins at the mouth of the river Yalu, and ascends that stream to the mouth of the river Anping. From thence the line runs to Fenghuang, and from thence to Haicheng, from thence to Yingkao, forming a line which describes the southern portion of the territory. The places above named are included in the ceded territory, when the line reaches the river Liao at Yingkao, it follows the course of that stream to its mouth, where it terminates. The mid-channel of the river Liao shall be taken as the line of demarcation. This session also includes all islands appertaining or belonging to the province of Feng Tien, situated in the eastern portion of the Bay of Liao Tung, and in the northern part of the Yellow Sea. B. The Island of Formosa together with all islands appertaining to the said island of Formosa. C. The Pescadores group, that is to say, all islands lying between the 119th and the 12th degrees of longitude east of Greenwich, and the 23rd and 240th degrees of north latitude. Article 3. The alignments of the frontiers described in the preceding article, and shown on the map, shall be subject to verification and demarcation on the spot by a joint commission of delimitation, consisting of two or more Japanese and two or more Chinese delegates to be appointed immediately after the exchange of the ratifications of this Act. In case the boundaries laid down in this Act are found to be defective at any point, either on account of topography or in consideration of good administration, it shall also be the duty of the delimitation commission to rectify the same. The Delimitation Commission will enter upon its duties as soon as possible, and will bring its labours to a conclusion within the period of one year after appointment. The alignments laid down in this Act shall, however, be maintained until the rectifications of the Delimitation Commission, if any are made, shall have received the approval of the governments of Japan and China. Article 4 China agrees to pay to Japan as a war indemnity the sum of 200 million Kuping tails. The said sum to be paid in eight instalments, the first instalment of 50 million tails to be paid within six months, and the second instalment of 50 million tails to be paid within 12 months after the exchange of the ratifications of this Act. The remaining sum to be paid in six equal annual instalments as follows. The first of such equal annual instalments to be paid within two years, the second within three years, the third within four years, and the fourth within five years, the fifth within six years, and the sixth within seven years, after the exchange of the ratifications of this Act. Interest at the rate of 5% per annum shall begin to run on all unpaid portions of the said indemnity from the date the first instalment falls due. China, however, shall have the right to pay by anticipation at any time any or all of said instalments. 
In case the whole amount of said indemnity is paid within three years after the exchange of ratifications of the present Act, all interest shall be waived, and the interest for two years and a half, or for any less period if then already paid, shall be included as part of the principal amount of the indemnity. Article 5. The inhabitants of the territory ceded to Japan, who wish to take up their residence outside the ceded districts, shall be at liberty to sell their real property and retire. For this purpose, a period of two years from the date of the exchange of the ratifications of the present Act shall be granted. At the expiration of that period, those of the inhabitants who shall not have left such territories shall, at the option of Japan, be deemed to be Japanese subjects. Each of the two governments shall, immediately upon the exchange of the ratifications of the present Act, send one or more commissioners to Formosa to effect a final transfer of that province, and within the space of two months after the exchange of the ratifications of this Act, such transfer shall be completed. Article 6. All treaties between Japan and China having come to an end in consequence of war, China engages, immediately upon the exchange of the ratifications of this Act, to appoint plenipotentiaries to conclude, with the Japanese plenipotentiaries, a treaty of commerce and navigation, and a convention to regulate frontier intercourse and trade. The treaties, conventions and regulations now subsisting between China and European powers shall serve as a basis for the said treaty and convention between Japan and China. From the date of the exchange of the ratifications of this Act, until the said treaty and convention are brought into actual operation, the Japanese government, its officials, commerce, navigation, frontier intercourse and trade, industries, ships and subjects, shall in every respect be accorded by China most favoured nation treatment. China makes, in addition, the following concessions, to take effect six months after the date of the present Act. First, the following cities, towns and ports in addition to those already opened, shall be open to the trade, residence, industries and manufactures of Japanese subjects, under the same conditions and with the same privileges and facilities as exist at the present open cities, towns and ports of China. 1. Shaxi in the province of Hubei. 2. Chongqing in the province of Sichuan. 3. Suzhou in the province of Jiangsu. 4. Hangzhou in the province of Zhejiang. The Japanese government shall have the right to station consuls at any or all of the above-named places. Second, steam navigation for vessels under the Japanese flag for the conveyance of passengers and cargo shall be extended to the following places. 1. On the upper Yangtze River from Yichang to Chongqing. 2. On the Wusung River and the Canal from Shanghai to Suzhou and Hangzhou. The rules and regulations which now govern the navigation of the inland waters of China by foreign vessels shall, so far as applicable, be enforced in respect of the above-named routes until new rules and regulations are conjointly agreed to. Third, Japanese subjects purchasing goods or produce in the interior of China or transporting imported merchandise into the interior of China shall have the right temporarily to rent or hire warehouses for the storage of the articles so purchased or transported without the payment of any taxes or exactions whatever. Fourth, Japanese subjects shall be free to engage in all kinds of manufacturing industries in all the open cities, towns and ports of China, and shall be at liberty to import into China all kinds of machinery, paying only the stipulated import duties thereon. All articles manufactured by Japanese subjects in China shall, in respect of inland transit and internal taxes, duties, charges and exactions of all kinds, and also in respect of warehousing and storage facilities in the interior of China, stand upon the same footing and enjoy the same privileges and exemptions as merchandise imported by Japanese subjects into China. In the event additional rules and regulations are necessary in connection with these concessions, they shall be embodied in the Treaty of Commerce and Navigation provided for by this article. Article 7. Subject to the provisions of the next succeeding article, the evacuation of China by the armies of Japan shall be completely effected within three months after the exchange of the ratifications of the present Act. Article 8. As a guarantee of the faithful performance of the stipulations of this Act, China consents to the temporary occupation 
by the military forces of Japan of Wei Highway in the province of Shandong. Upon the payment of the first two instalments of the war indemnity herein stipulated for, and the exchange of the ratifications of the Treaty of Commerce and Navigation, said place shall be evacuated by Japanese forces, provided the Chinese government consents to pledge, under suitable and sufficient arrangements, the customs revenue of China as security for the payment of the final instalment of said indemnity. It is, however, expressly understood that no such evacuation shall take place until after the exchange of the ratifications of the Treaty of Commerce and Navigation. Article 9. Immediately upon the exchange of the ratifications of this Act, all prisoners of war then held shall be restored, and China undertakes not to ill-treat or punish prisoners of war so restored to her by Japan. China also engages to at once release all Japanese subjects accused of being military spies or charged with any other military offences. China further engages not to punish in any manner, nor allow to be punished, those Chinese subjects who have in any manner been compromised in their relations with the Japanese army during the war. Article 10. All offensive military operations shall cease upon the exchange of the ratifications of this Act. Article 11. The present Act shall be ratified by their Majesties the Emperor of Japan and the Emperor of China, and the ratifications shall be exchanged at Shifu on the eighth day of the fifth month of the twenty-eighth year of Meiji, corresponding to the fourteenth day of the fourth month of the twenty-first year of Guangxu. In witness whereof the respective plenipotentiaries have signed the same, and have affixed thereto the seal of their arms. Dana Shimonoseki in duplicate, this seventeenth day of the fourth month of the twenty-eighth year of Meiji, corresponding to the twenty-third day of the third month of the twenty-first year of Guangxu. Count Ito Hirobumi, Viscount Matsu Munimitsu, Li Hang Chang, Li Ching Fong. Separate Articles Article 1. The Japanese military forces, which are under Article 8 of the Treaty of Peace signed this day, to temporarily occupy Wei Highway, shall not exceed one brigade. And from the date of the exchange of the ratifications of the said Treaty of Peace, China shall pay, annually, one-fourth of the amount of the expenses of such temporary occupation, that is to say, at the rate of 500,000 Kuping tails per annum. Article 2. The territory temporarily occupied at Wei Highway shall comprise of the island of Liu Kung, and a belt of five Japanese re wide along the entire coastline of the Bay of Wei Highway. No Chinese troops shall be permitted to approach or occupy any places within a zone five Japanese re wide beyond the boundaries of the occupied territory. Article 3. The civil administration of the occupied territory shall remain in the hands of the Chinese authorities but such authorities shall at all times be obliged to conform to the orders which the Japanese Army of Occupation may deem it necessary to give in the interest of the health, maintenance, safety, distribution or discipline of the troops. All military offences committed within the occupied territory shall be subject to the jurisdiction of the Japanese military authorities. The foregoing separate articles shall have the same force, value and effect as if they had been word for word inserted in the Treaty of Peace signed this day. In witness whereof, the respective plenipotentiaries have signed the same, and affixed thereto the seal of their arms. Done that Shimonoseki, in duplicate, this seventeenth day of the fourth month of the twenty-eighth year of Meiji, corresponding to the twenty-first year of Guangxu. Count Ito Hirobumi, Viscount Matsu Munimitsu, Li Hang Chang, End of The Treaty of Shimonoseki by John Watson Foster, Li Hongzang, Li Jingfang, Ito Hirobumi, and Matsu Munimitsu.